this meeting to order. <coughs> Ms. Serza, um, oh, I'm sorry, can I, do we call the roll, Ms. Serza? Yes. Can you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Second? Second. Thank you. There's been a motion to approve the agenda and a second. Ms. Serza, can you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Excellent. Thank you. Um, before we begin our uh, dive into our agenda, um, we have a couple of statements to make. Mr. Kelly? As a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2017-18 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I'd like to add that as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 17-18 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe that I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Dr. Herring? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're ex excited to be here this morning to give you your first uh, look at our budget for this year. And without saying any more, I'm going to hand over to our expert, uh, Ms. Berta, Chief Financial Officer. Ms. Berta. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Today I will pre be presenting to you, along with the support of my colleagues, information as it pertains to the fiscal year 28 budget development process. Here's an overview of the agenda we would like to review today. Number one, we will take a look at the overview of the state requirements by state code. Then we will look at how we have processed the budget up until this point. Then we will take a look at historical funding information, look at salary adjustment recommendations, as well as staffing department requests and non-personnel department requests. And then we will take a look at the local composite index and how that changed last biennium, or at the beginning of this biennium last year, and to look at the governor's proposed budget. Just as a reminder, State Code 22.1-92 requires the superintendent and the school board to prepare a budget of deemed needs for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's important as we go through this process that we truly evaluate the needs that we need to support the schools and the school division. 15.2-2503 reminds us that by April 1st, on or before, we must approve a budget to pass to our funding partners, both Williamsburg and James City County. So between now and April 1, we have to have some finalization about what we deem those needs to be. As we develop the budget, we work to align the request with the division strategic plan that focuses on identified outcomes within that plan. We also develop a budget that supports those identified needs based on our input from our stakeholders. So we began the development of the operating budget in October um, with training on our new financial system because that's the way we're developing the budget this year. Um, we also had input from our cost center managers. We met with every individual cost center manager, HR, and my team from finance to discuss the needs um, that they brought forward and to really challenge and make sure that what they were proposing was true, truly a need of the division as we went forward into the new year. Then in November and December, we as a cabinet began to evaluate those cost center requests and did some more review to make sure that what was coming through to you all was really a necessity for the division as we move forward. And of course, today we're here to present to you those things that we deemed necessary and to get an idea from you how those items would be prioritized um, to allocate our resources that we do have available to us. So a little bit of a historical journey. As we look at enrollment, you can see in 2007, <coughs> Williamsburg James City County had an enrollment on September 30th of 10,137 students. Moving forward to September 30th of this year, we had an enrollment of 11,431 students. Between that time, we have experienced a growth of 1,294 students. It's important to note that this enrollment is strictly K-12 enrollment. It does not include preschool. The Future Think low enrollment projection for next year shows a growth of 28 students to an enrollment of 11,459. 
And that, that's the low, most likely? That is the low enrollment projection. Okay, and that's where we've been normally tracking to? It is. Okay. Yeah, we've been within 1% of that every year for the last five years. Why do we think the low growth is so low from this year? Uh, when we analyzed that, looking back five years ago, the birth rate was a significant decrease from prior years. So looking at what our projected kindergarten enrollment correlates directly to the birth rate of five years ago. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're thinking um, because that is lower than what it has been for the last several right. years with only a 28 student right. increase. So we'll talk a bit about that in a few slides. It's almost lost in the noise. And there's some factors that impact that as well, such an, an influx of English language learners that we can't anticipate at this moment in sure. time and does this not affect it by birth rate. Sure. Ms. Berto, can you just tell me what was the increase in student enrollment this year? Um, we had 100, uh, 129. 129, yeah. 129. Mm -hmm. So then we take a look at how our state funding has trended, and we always use 2009 as our benchmark because that's the recession year. So we go back to our enrollment on September 30th with 10,249 students in 2009 with a state budget of 32,785. Looking at the current year, our enrollment has increased by 1,182 students from that time period to 11,431. However, our state budget has declined over that period to 31,692,035. So while we've had an increase of 1,182 students, the support that we're receiving from the state has significantly declined, um, along with increased mandates. So we're trying to balance that um, with what our legislators are telling the public at large that we are seeing an increase in funding, but that is not a factual statement. And Williamsburg, James City County has been very fortunate to have increased enrollment because our surrounding divisions have not experienced that. So this is a pretty significant um, historical view of how the state has supported public education, particularly for us on this slide. Yeah, that's not inflation adjusted. Either. No. And this, uh, the Board of Education recently came out publicly and said that the, they, in their estimation, the state is shorting public education by about $600 million across the state. Yeah. So one of those areas uh, that Dr. Heron alluded to that we are experiencing some population growth, pretty significant population growth, is our English language learner population. Looking back to school year 2009-10, that English language learner population was 199 students. As we look at our enrollment for that same population in the current school year, we're seeing 628 students. So that's a growth of 429 students over the last seven school years. Uh, this population growth creates the need for additional support in order to provide these students and families with the resources to make them successful. Another population that we've experienced uh, some su substantial growth in is our special education department, special education students. From school year 09-10, we had an enrollment at December 1st of 1,551 special education students. Looking at the current year, December 1st count, we have 1,715 students. That is a growth of 164 students. In addition to the growth in the sheer number of the student demographic, we have also seen an increase in the higher need disabilities, which equates to significant increase in direct services that are required by a student's IEP. Um, has the criteria for what determines whether a child is special ed changed at all? And, and Ms. Yeah. Bourgeois is shaking her head no. Okay, so it's. So now we will begin to look at some options on the table for the fiscal year 18 budget process with regard to salary increases. The first option that we have on the table is to continue migrating our teachers through the salary scale and giving them a step increase. And that scale equates to an average of 1.5% salary increase. So we are recommending that that 1.5% also be applied to all other staff. The cost associated with that, including FICA, is $1.2 million. It is important to note that this option would impact employees' retirement. It continues to move them through the scale that was corrected last year to eliminate compression. So if we don't migrate teachers through the scale, we go backwards, we slide backwards and create compression again. The second option is just to sheerly show you what a 1% salary increase, every 1% equates to a $850,000 impact on the budget. If we gave a sheer percentage increase, it's important to note that would affect employees' retirement, 
but it would also create compression in the scale again because we wouldn't be able to give a step increase. The third option is in the governor's recommended budget. He is proposing a 1.5% budget of bonus to all staff in December of 2017. That bonus would be a one-time payment. It would be based on 1.5% of an annual salary. And the support that we would receive from the state would strictly be for SOQ funded teacher and support positions. So we know from option one that a 1.5% and a step increase would be 1.2 million netted against the anticipated uh, governor's <coughs> proposed revenue that we would receive to support that of 368,000 would create a budget impact for us of 832,000. It would also be important to note that this would not impact an employee's retirement and it would not allow us to move people through a scale. And if we don't accept that, are we leaving that money on the table? We are. Leaving it on the table. Please. We would not be able to accept the $368,000 unless we agreed to apply the 1.5% bonus as outlined in the legislation. And it's an either or? They do not allow you to give a salary increase. It's very prescribed in the language that is written now that it is for a one-time bonus. So if we get, did option one, we would not be able to take advantage of those funds the way it's currently written. Ms. Berta, what is the state offering to their employees? They're also in the governor's proposed budget is the bonus. Okay, thank you. It's the bonus for all state employees. And then had, was it ever considered to do the step increase for teachers and a 1% increase for all other staff? To <clears throat> we certainly can combine options. These are just strictly to show you what's, what the cost impact would be of the decisions we make as far as salary increases. We have never separated and treated staff differently within the division, and it's certainly not something I would recommend at all. Yeah, there's a, a, the, uh, the teacher population is much greater than the rest of the staff. So the rest of the staff is kind of a, I mean, not a really a, a, a kind of a budget insignificant number, really, when you get, when you get down to that. Um, the 1.2 million, that's that's all in, right? That's increased VRS, that's, in, that's all that's the... That's everything, yes. That's everything. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So based on those three options, we would like to take a few moments to seek your input. Uh, Ms. Overcamp Smith will explain how this ranking exercise and the rest of the ranking exercises this morning will work. Good morning. Good morning. And at your place underneath your microphone, you have dots. What we would like you to do is in between each of the um, sections dots. of Chris. No, no, dots. Dots. no, dots. no right here. It has your name on it. Oh, oh, it's upside down. It's upside down. Uh, I saw this, I figured you just leave it. I wanted your color to be a surprise. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, in between sections, we're going to ask you to take your dot and select your priority in each of the areas. So we have three priorities in under salary, and you have one dot that you can use to put on any of these three pri pri priorities. Um, as we move down, you're going to have a different number of dots based on the total number of options that you have presented to you. So if you want to get up, take a dot, one dot only, um, and select which of the three is your priority of the three that Before I vote, can I ask one question sure. about um, so if we decide to uh, go into a situation in which we have compression again, mm -hmm. is, is it fair to assume that getting out of it would be 2.4 million, double the one? That would be correct. If we migrated year. teachers two steps and gave all other employees 3%, yes. So it would be about 2.4 so million. So next year it would be a 2.4, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So if we, if we decide to go with either one of these next year to get back on out of compression will cost 2.4 million. <laughs>
Any other questions about salary before I move forward? Now we begin to review the staffing requests that were received during the review process with cost center managers in our cabinet. The first request that has come through is to increase our elementary instructional and teaching assistants to a seven and a half hour day contract to align them with their current school day. The cost budget impact on this would be 165000 Moving forward, we are also have received a request to increase our instructional technology resource teachers from a 203-day contract to a 208-day contract. The cost of this would be $15,000 to move that direction. The rationale behind that one is that for the last two years, these employees have worked $208 to support the division, um, 208 days, yes, to support the division. And uh, because that is becoming a trend and a need for the division, that's why we're pushing it to make it a permanent change in contract. And there's the cost associated with that extra work during the last two summers, which we've gathered the data, and it was 16,000 one year and 14,000, I believe, the, the, the first year. So this represents what we pay in supplemental pay. Anyway, to move it to this, then, te then these staff would get retirement on the money, but the money is still money we're going to have to pay. So, so you're saying we are, we're, you anticipate we're already going to be paying fifteen thousand based on our two year, two years of data points. Yes. We already have been paying the fifteen thousand. We've yes. been paying more than that. Actually, we're paying the sixteen thousand. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, teaching assistants seven and a half hours per day. How much? How many? How much do they work now? Seven hours a day. So this adds half an hour to it. Yes. Are most of these teacher assistants, are they uh, with the preschool programs at kindergarten? It is at the elementary level, elementary. all of elementary. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that change also creates consistency again uh, with that group of employees so that if we needed to shift them to the secondary school, they are working the same number of hours. So it provides some consistency with that group of employees across the board. So the, the secondary they teaching work. assistants already work? Seven, and a, half Seven hours. and a half hours. Correct. So the only group of the teaching assistants are the elementary ones that are working seven currently. Yes. Okay. The next request is to add one and a half FTEs to our budget by converting three of our current half time FTEs and our gifted and talented teachers to three full time FTEs to provide service at our elementary schools. The budget impact of this would be $115,000. The next request is to add three FTEs, mm -hmm. one school improvement specialist at each middle school. The cost impact of this would be $250,000. And so, I'm sorry. If Go ahead. And the school improvement specialists are the ones that are taking the kids that are not up to grade level and working with them? Or could you just tell me? I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Thorpe to give us a sense of what that position does. This was a position that we introduced at the high school level um, about three years ago. It was a new position to the division. And this person be actually becomes like a, a quasi-administrator on the administrative team and uh, takes care of all of the testing and data analysis for the administrative team that they come become part of that leadership team and i'll get mr thorpe to, to give us a little bit more detail on what they do on a daily basis we've had it at high school we really feel instructionally would be a great asset at the middle school good morning well dr heron you said quite a bit there about the school improvement <laughs> specialist <laughs> position all, all, already so again this is this is an entry level administrative support position that's uh it's 11 month it's on the teacher salary scale um, and this is an employee that would oversee the school improvement process and provide our departments, teachers, and grade levels with the data necessary to provide students with what they needed in order to be successful. In addition to that, they would assume other duties of the assistant principal and principal to relieve them so that they can support teaching and learning at the school. Um, so in the event of uh, this position being in place, they would be looking after a lot of the testing, um, data analysis, they may do some minor administrative duties and that will release the current one AP at middle school uh, to be able to do the real role of the AP and, and give some extra administrative support 
and yet it's a teacher leadership position mm. preparing possible candidates for our new middle school to become assistant principals. So you don't currently have any of these at our middle schools now? That's correct. So this is a, a job done by the APs? It is. The APs do everything now, and we have one AP for 900 students. And I know Mr. Baker has got some data to compare our middle schools with other middle schools in the region. So it's not adding an administrator, but it's actually starting to prepare someone to become an administrator that we can use later on, as well as being an incredible asset to the instructional side of the school. So all of these positions would be probably you would be looking at current teachers and elevating them, I guess, so to speak, to this role, and then you'd have to backfill their positions with a... Correct. And so it's an extra month. Um, 11 month. 11, 11 month, month position. 10. Um, but they really do become part of the administrative team within the building. As you know, our middle schools are full. Um, the assistant principals, as the numbers have gone up, we haven't added any administrative support. This is a, a, a position right in the middle between teacher and administrator that would allow us to, to create that support within the school. Um, and for us, it's one of, we've looked at many uh, requests for positions, 36 in total this year coming through as far as cabinet, and this was one of the positions that we really felt would add incredible value to our schools. I'd like to hear the data that Mr. Baker has. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thorne. Good morning. Uh, we were looking at some of the other our neighboring districts from McNewport News and York and how they have the administrative staff in their middle schools. So at Newport News, their middle schools, uh, they have uh, three assistant principals at their middle schools. And York County has two assistant principals at their middle school. Uh, we also looked at uh, Chesapeake. They have several middle schools. Some actually have four assistant principals in the middle school. Um, most of them have three, and some very, very small of their middle schools actually have two there, assistant principals. So what are the sizes of those schools? Um, at York, it was uh, 700 to 900 students, and they have two APs. Um, at Newport News, they have 900, approximately 900 students, and they have three APs. Another middle school in Newport News has approximately 550 <coughs> students, and they have two APs. And their APs are full-time APs. They're not doing correct. some teaching. They're, they're some. Correct. They're correct. They're currently APs. Uh, we also looked at Hampton. They had a variety of middle schools, some extremely large, even larger than ours, closer to 1,800 students. They had four APs. Uh, they have a middle, middle schools from 900 students to uh, up to uh, 1,700 with three APs. Um, and middle schools from 600 students to 900 students with two APs, and that was in uh, Hampton. We also looked at Gloucester, which had uh, middle schools with approximately 700 and so students with two APs. So uh, our, our middle school assistant principals are very light compared to our neighbors. And we've, we debated long and hard to bring forward either three additional APs for your consideration or this position. This position is um, incredibly valuable, but is less expensive. Um, but obviously, if the board wants to consider and thinks that we should be looking at assistant principals instead, um, that would be something we'd like your input on. But we really feel our middle schools are struggling, and as we move, we're still in a holding pattern until we have our new middle school online. So, doing this, um, then once the fourth middle comes online, <coughs> If it was a, an assistant principal position that we added, then they would be redistributed again as the schools become smaller and we bring a new middle school online. That's the advantage of going for a full assistant principal position. And, like, and likewise, would these uh, improvement specialists qualify to be an AP so that if we wanted to go that direction later, we can do that? They would be incredibly well prepared. They would be like our succession planning yeah, sure. piece to be ready for the AP positions that then would become available in the new middle school. Right. So in, in future years, we want to upgrade this from a school improvement specialist to an AP. Absolutely. That would be possible. That is a possibility. And this is a fabulous training ground because they really learn the whole instructional piece of the building inside out and the data analysis to be an instructional leader and a potential principal in the future. So we choose these people very carefully with future leadership in mind. 
And how much would three APs cost? It's about three hundred and fifteen thousand. And then I'm assuming there would be a lot of synergy between the school improvement specialists at the high schools, because we have them at the high schools, right? Yes, we actually, a lot of the training for these staff is actually done by the Department of Accountability, and so they get a lot of their ongoing training for data analysis for school improvement planning, then they bring that back to the building and work with the principal in the development of their plan. So they're, they're, we do have a central influence on the work that they do that's very, very important when we established the position, that, that was a big piece of the puzzle. And would these um, positions report to the principals or report to someone in central office? They, they, because they're school-based, they absolutely report to the principals, but we provide support and training centrally. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker. Any other questions? How many students do we currently have in our middle schools now? Approximately. Um. Berkeley has 883, Toledo has 805, and Hornsby has 938. The next request is for the expansion of our preschool program to a fifth school site. It's important to note that this is not increasing the capacity of our preschool program, it is strictly the relocation to another school site to alleviate some pressures on our current four preschool sites. With this change, it would require an increase to one speech language pathologist currently at 0.86 FTE to one FTE the addition of a part-time instructional assistant to support that school, and the increase of one special education resource teacher from 0.86 FTE to one FTE. The impact of those three changes in staffing would increase the budget by approximately 40,000. So this isn't really an expansion of the preschool program, it's a relocation? Correct. The reason we're, we're asking you to consider this is because uh, Rawls Bird and JBB were completely full last year. Yep. And so we've no room for additional students in those two elementary schools. So by shifting the preschool program and adding another unit, we're, we're spreading the students out. That means our schools won't be full as quickly. So we're really trying to look at our resources and, and use them in the best possible way. So this moves... This moves um to additional site to help increase capacity for K through five at the other elementary schools. Correct. Correct. So we won't need an elementary school as quickly if we create another location for our preschool. Okay. That's the thinking behind it. What it's looking looking ahead. The transportation impact. Um, Negligible. Or? Virtually none. <coughs> Could you repeat that just so it, It'll be minimal transportation cost in addition to what we currently do because it's in a centrally, centrally located and the, the additional site we're looking at is DJ. And DJ's enrollment right now is, Mr. Thorpe, you have that? Yes, it's at 464 and with a capacity of 590. So they have room for the program <coughs> and they're centrally located as well. So we're really trying to think into the future so we we keep capacity within our elementary schools. Would there, oh, I'm sorry, would there be any additional <coughs> needs, for, uh, equipment, cost for equipment? That's coming next. There's okay. one, one specific piece that comes in the next piece of, of presentation. Mm -hmm. Just one follow-up question. So <coughs> no new preschool children will be served. It's just moving existing. That's correct. Um, and was any thought if there is room capacity at DJ of just uh, switching um, from Jackie, but you know what I mean like was any was that ever considered so that there, you're not having an increase <coughs> in cost I think we would end up the, the, the one major cost involved is coming up in the next piece of the presentation and even if we shifted the whole program this cost would still exist and it's actually in the form of a playground for that level of student but but we wouldn't have this expense Mr. Thorpe, can you help us with that? Because you've been, I know, looking at the numbers and really going through it for me. 
one follow-up question. So <coughs> is there enough room at DJ to, to take the whole JBB program I'm and put it at DJ? I don't, I, I can't imagine that there would be. There, no. there's, there's not. Yeah. There's not. Hi, good morning again. Ms. Hummel, could you please repeat the question? Uh, I was wondering if, since there's excess space, rather than at DJ, if that is one of the options to, rather than, spend $40,000 to expand this to DJ, look at um, maybe swapping one of the locations that are currently providing this over to DJ and saving this money. That's all. But that's Thank you. That's, that's a great question. We, we didn't consider that because, um, for instance, at Rawlsburg, they have seven Bright Beginnings classrooms and DJ does not have that amount of space. JBB currently has um, eight Bright Beginnings classrooms, and again, we don't have that much space at, at DJ to just swap. Is that what you were asking? Uh, yes, but okay. so then this is <coughs> how many classrooms is this going to take up, I guess, at DJ? Yep. Our, our plan would be three classrooms, so we would be relieving uh, two classrooms from Rawlsburg Elementary School, the DJ Montague, and one from Jay Blayton. I got you. Okay. So this, this creates okay. space in two elementary schools. Oh, That's correct. Okay, great. I great. just needed that. Okay, fine. To me. Those are the staffing requests that we are bringing forward to you for prioritization this morning. So Betsy can let you know how many dots you are allowed to put on I, these <coughs> items. Can I just say that um, the increase the con ITRT contract from 203 to 208, since that's really budget neutral, mm -hmm. should we just do that and not vote on it? Because it's not an increase of budget, it's actually almost a little bit of a decrease of budget. Yeah. So can we just call that done? And, and then look Sorry, at other things. That would be great. Else. That's a, a great, great suggestion. Thank you. So for this, you used to have five options. You now have four. Um, and you have You're three welcome. dots. Three dots. So you're not putting me on a budget. That's not like I have a spending limit. You're making me use three dots. <laughs> <laughs> The increase in the pre-K, is that staff, does, is that to accommodate staff travel time because there's adding this site? Correct. Okay. So you can't expand without that cost? Correct. Or transfer, I should say. Yes. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your input. Now we will begin to review the non-personnel related budget request. <clears throat> As we alluded to with the preschool discussion, the expansion to DJ Montague would require us to build a specialized playground and fence to support those students. That Im cost impact would be $72,500. 60,000 of it is for the playground equipment and 12,500 for the fence. And so if we did this, this would be long term, like we would correct. We would plan on Bright Beginnings being there for a very, very, very long time. Uh, absolutely, because we're going, we're going to need the space in the other two elementary schools or we're going to have to redistrict elementary um, and find space because they're both full. And so Bright Beginnings was at DJ <coughs> several years ago and I, and it, yeah, because my, my son was in it at DJ. Don't know. Yeah. 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 And I don't recall what, I think they had temporary equipment. I'm not sure what kind of play equipment they had, but we were 
the Bright Beginnings program was in trailers in the parking lot at DJ. Um, so, speak to that. <coughs> Mr. Thorpe may have the history as well. I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't have that history. Um, however, I do know that DJ Montague currently has um, a lovely playground equipment, but it is not specified to safety ratings for children under six. Right. So, yes, the $60,000 for playground equipment would be a long-term investment in early childhood education at the school. I know we were there, we moved. We were there, we moved. Right before, right before Blayton was built. And then after Blayton opened, it moved to Blayton. Makes sense. Um, this is just kind of a general question. Okay, so these things seem like CIP items, like they're capital improvement. But we're how does that? Fit? I mean, we already kind of approved our CIP for the next. So how does that work? this budget process they could be CIP items absolutely but when we were developing the CIP and really trying to figure out capacities of building that would affect our operational budget this issue came to light where we could um, develop a long-term solution to alleviate some of the, the space issues we were experiencing at Rawlsburg and, and JBB um, in order to make this happen quicker rather than have to go through the CIP process next year and then be funded out years it's, it's been the decision of administration to bring this forward in the operating budget to make that happen quicker than it would by waiting till the next CIP process. Right, well it's also some, some discussion that we've had as far as what is capital and what yeah. is yeah. operating. So the, the bus replacement, <coughs> it, as long as you're not expanding the fleet, has been deemed to be operating and not come out of the capital. The trailer, like the trailer set up there, one time setup cost, that would be operating and not, and the rental yeah. the, would also be operating. But a playground and a fence, yeah, I don't Technically, think it, might, it could be. Not, it is probably better placed in the capital improvement plan, but we weren't in a position to to bring it forward at that time. That all of the there is a schedule in the CIP for the replacement of all of the current playgrounds, so it is generally a capital improvement plan expense. Yeah, that was something you talk about with the with the finance folks from the county and the city, but but it might also be a, such a low a low level that it's not deemed to be capital, since it's only seventy two thousand. What happens if that playground doesn't get built? Legally, we couldn't move the program until we have the playground. Right. Um, I mean, can't provide services. How can't would you provide do it when you were in a, play, in a that's trailer? What I, that's what I was asking. They were both what of you were trying to think like of there, was, there, there was a different kind. There was a separate playground. I don't recall what that looked like. I think it was, it was more temporary play equipment that's no longer there. Yeah, because it was on the other side of the school from the playground. Right, it was, there was a separate section that was designated for preschool children. Right. We're concerned and go back and try to figure out <coughs> what was done historically there. Um, I'm not sure what the enrollment projection is for Rawlsburg and JBB for next year. If they still, last year we were literally looking for classrooms in Rawlsburg yeah. Elementary. Um, so this is like a, a planning for the future as our enrollment increases. Um, do you have that there, Mr. Thorpe? I thought you might. I, I do. So, uh, Rossbird's capacity is 500. They're currently at 489, and their projected enrollment for next year is 490. So they're they're over 90 percent capacity now. Okay. So we would anticipate this move would take place. What year? If if we approve the staffing and playground, we could be doing it next year. If we don't, then potentially we would bring it back for your consideration again. There is the possibility we could, with anticipated lower enrollment increases, which is very unpredictable, because our, what's the middle projection for Rawlsburg? Do we have it on JBB? I was going by most, most likely. <coughs> um, that, 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 that's that's exactly what we want. Uh, okay. That's fine. And then blatant for, for next year, uh, 515. An increase of? Uh, Currently, they're at 513 with a capacity of 540. Just one other side note. So this doesn't really impact the budget, but, but a reason to expand the pre-K program is that it would conceivably have students entering their school sooner. Where my son was at North Bright Beginnings, 
He was at the DJ Bright Beginnings, he was at Blayton Bright Beginnings, and then he went back home to DJ. So a lot of children are in Bright Beginnings for two or three years. So if we have multiple sites, those children will be in their home school. Another reason to show the center, instead of bopping around lots of different schools. So lots to consider. We definitely need to create another site to make sure our schools have capacity. The timing is, is, a, is a question, especially with the enrollment projection for next year. But we really were struggling for, we had to create another s classroom at RVB this year, and it was extremely difficult to do. We, we literally found the last possible space in the building. So it's a balancing act. <clears throat> Ms. Burton. Yep. The next request is for the continuation of the bus replacement plan. Um, as you know, we were fortunate enough to have eight of our buses, eight of the ten buses that we are slated to replace in the current upcoming fiscal year um, approved through the year and spending plan. This purchase of two buses would allow us to complete that ten required buses based on age and mileage um, at a cost of $218,000. So then in the 18-19 operating budget, we would put in 10. Correct. Okay. The next item that always comes up in the budget <laughs> process, and uh, we experience a little bit of this here in the recent past, is snow removal. Um, we are requesting the addition of snow removal costs to be added back into the budget at a cost of $300,000. Not that we ever get snow or anything, but how do we do it now? Marcellus. <laughs> Marcellus has a shovel. <laughs> he actually he has, actually has a shovel. Yeah, a big shovel. Yeah. Yeah. A nice pick. Um, good morning, school board members. Uh, we currently use a uh, contractor on uh, uh, with us in the, with the county, and they, they come out and they clear lots. We also just recently started a pilot program where a couple of years ago you allowed us to purchase some plows and we can do some of our smaller sites with that, such here as Blair and then operations and we actually um, did Rawls Bird this year as well. So we're expanding that program to try to incorporate more. So, but right now we currently use a contract. So how much, how much did we pay for snow removal now with the contract? Uh, it did, it, they, they charge us based on the number of hours that they sure. they use, not by site, because if you get two inches of snow or just ice or four yeah, inches, sure. or, so they charge us by um, by how many hours um, it, it, and what it, they it bring out. It has varied a lot over the it's, last few years. It's varied. We keep track of you know the amount of snowfall and how much we've spent. Um, I'm giving you for an example, in 2015, we spent about a hundred and seventy thousand dollars, but in 2016, we spent over three hundred thousand dollars just for that. And we're, you know, just because of the amount of snow that we got. So. Right. And so this this snow removal is for is for equipment. No, and stuff. the snow removal is actually to pay the contractor if we get snow because currently we don't have the capability of. Um, so so know. that three hundred thousand dollars is for a contractor. Yeah, that's what we pay it's to pay, now. It's to pay Curtis. It, it's yeah. to, yes. So so then if if we approve this and it goes into something, then if we have a good warm winter, then we've got three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That is to correct. Pay for, for example, the buses should correct. they not should we not need it? Or, yeah, or, you know, or to continue more? to expand our. You won't know until March that you, you don't need know. the money. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Or to continue right. to expand our snow um, pilot our program. So, <laughs> or sorry. to continue to expand our program. So, for example, if we do not use those funds this year, well, we've used some of it already. We can find out <laughs> where that bill comes to next week. Um, <laughs> if we don't use any of those any more of those funds, we could go out and p purchase more equipment. And to start do, doing some other things, but it's just not about plows. It's about it's about backhoes. It's about it's about dump trucks. It's about sanding material. There's a there's a there's a large um, effort to to move snow. So once again, that that three hundred thousand dollars there is not to <coughs> equip and man you. It's just for a contract. It is just for a contract. And so it's really money that we already spend anyway. We, Generally speaking, if it snows, <laughs> we have to we have to do it. We have to find it. Well, I understand. Okay. But I understand your question. It's how are we doing it now? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, if, if we're looking at a budget of a hundred and you know, at, at, or the number where we are, that we're at, at three hundred thousand, you can kind of find it if you need it. 
it takes away from other items that we intended on purchasing. So if Marcellus had a plan to purchase some fleet cars and we needed to fund right. snow, we don't purchase the fleet cars to pay the contractor. So we're robbing Peter to pay Paul in order to make sure that we can meet our obligations to our contract. Right, but there's a number in there this year for the budget for snow removal, right? 75? 75. Yeah. It was reduced to balance our budget in the current year. So that's why we're asking for the restoration of it so that we don't have to continue to go through that process of finding funding should it snow. But we're balancing this request against these other We are. Absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And I believe the buses did not make it last year and that was we used end of year funds to do the buses last year as well. Right. Right. The next request is to add a trailer at Jamestown High School due to the overcapacity situation that we have there. The cost of that is a $80,000 one-time setup cost and an annual rental of $2,500 per month for the trailer. The total budget impact for fiscal year 18 would be $110,000. Do they have any trailers there now? They do not. Can you refresh our memories on the overcrowding? Can you give us, provide some numbers, please? Currently this year we were 139 students over capacity at Jamestown. And then where are we at Warhill and Lafayette? We're under capacity at both schools. Okay. It begs the question of eventually looking at redistricting. Mm -hmm. And we continue to monitor as our, our threshold 90% capacity. So that, that has been deemed the, the trigger point um, as we look at those items annually or more frequently um, to make sure that we are accommodating future space. Do we needs. have trailers anywhere in the division? Yes. Is that a high school? We had trailers at Berkeley. Trailers at Berkeley Middle School. And so do we own those trailers or do we rent those trailers? We rent trailers. Yeah, Mr. Snipes will give us a quick sense. Uh, we've actually looked at owning and renting, um, but he can speak to the devaluation of owned trailers pretty quickly. Yeah, there are there's some devaluation to owning and um, to owning the trailers. It's a setup fee, it's also a removal fee. It's about if we do not use them at a certain point we have to store them. Um, there is just a, we we've owned them in the past and it turns out to be a, a lot more expensive than, than just renting them. Yeah. Staff have looked at it pretty closely because we've asked the question several times. And so there are trailers at Berkeley but also Matthew Matthew Whaley. Okay. Yes. Trailers at Berkeley Matthew Whaley. Just to give a sense, I know we're 139 students over at Jamestown this year. Um, increase for next year. Scott, can you look at your enrollment report, please? Well, the whole district's only 128. There's only a handful. Of yeah, it's not stressful. Um, Jamestown. Uh, but when, 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 when would redistricting? Be implemented. It would be the decision of the board when we do redistricting whether that should include high schools or not. Or we, we need to do it for the middle school, we don't have a choice, but there are choices with the rest. But if you did it, it wouldn't be any earlier than 2018. Correct. There's still a right. year with it sur surviving for a year before that would happen. So, a key question is how much and many more students are they likely to get next year? And this trailer would be there next year. Yes. This incoming, yes, 2017, 2018. Correct. correct. Mr. Thorpe, do you have the increase in Jamestown? I'm, I'm very sorry. I only printed elementary. No, well, thank you. Um, I'll have to get it. I'll get it when we have a break. I'm guessing it's minimal with uh, only 28 across the system. It's going to be a minimal increase across However, the board. However, there could be spot redistricting done mm -hmm. that could mitigate the need mm -hmm. for a temporary trailer that, that would be in line with with a, a larger plan that's coming down the pike. Could, could you get us a feel for how many students and what that capacity is at each of the high schools? We certainly can, yes, absolutely. And, and so if we did put this 110,000 in the budget, it would pres if, if the school board decided to redistrict high schools, and that's a big if, um, this would be a one year. Correct, cost. correct. So, I mean, they're, they're coping well with a lot of extra students this year. It, if they're not anticipated to get a lot more, um, it, it is a one-year. It'd be expense. the same the same issue they have this year if they're only going if they only change yeah. by a couple of handfuls. And the biggest expense is the setup. Yeah. And then um, the cafeteria. Can you help us r remind us how that the timing of that 
expansion if that. Marcellus, can you remember that? I know it's in fiscal year 19 was yeah. when the funding request was made. Okay. So it would take 18 to 24 months once that funding is approved to okay. build and okay. figure out the timeline for that. So in your estimation, it's crowded there. I mean, it is. It's it's crowded, um, but they're coping. They're, they're managing well, and. Um, Ms. Dr. Worley has even identified the space for the potential innovation program next year within that. Is, aren't there trailers at Berkeley? Yes, absolutely. So with the innovation grant though, Jamestown could conceivably experience a significant enrollment increase. There could be a, sh sh a shift. To go there. Um, obviously, it's limited to 100 students, but it, it could impact it enrollment impact. next year. It will impact. Students. Yeah, can you remind us the number of, because Warhill, not just from um, Jamestown and Lafayette, but there were some Montessori and homeschool kids who came into that program. Can yes, you um, 75 of the students were our Warhill students. In the Warhill pilot this year, 25 have come from outside. We have no idea how that will redistribute if 300 students can apply in ninth grade to three different high schools next year. Right, so Jamestown is over capacity by 139 now. Correct. And we're saying that with the new innovation grants, <coughs> conceivably 100 brand new kids that aren't Jamestown kids could go there? No. no. Most are likely to be Jamestown, okay. and right. some may leave Jamestown to go somewhere else. Um, it was a 75 Warhill students stayed there. They weren't new students. There were only 25 <laughs> new students at Warhill this year. The in two high schools. So they, were, they were zoned or to be at the other high school. Right. Or, or, they were, or they were zoned to be at the two high schools. Right. Exactly. So, so, so at the end of the day, I would probably say you call it a push, but it's, yeah. you, know, it lose as many, you lose as many as you could get. Because some could go to Warhill, some could go to Lafayette. And, okay. and there's a cap on the, there's a cap on the number, so right. it, it will be over a hundred. Okay. And, and James tends to apply. Is the trailer for just one class per period? That's what I'm trying I to understand. I believe, I believe it's two classrooms each trailer that we build. Each trailer is two classrooms. Okay. That, thank you. Our decision. Mm -hmm. um, just whenever we talk trailers, it just um, it's when I think about weather and especially if they're sure. safety drills and so forth, it's trailers are never great. If this is not put into the budget, does it force the issue of spot redistricting? No, because that probably needs to be looked at by someone with the ability to really look across our whole system and that really needs to become part of a bigger discussion when we redistrict our middle schools. Uh, I don't see it as something we'd want to do just in a small group for one year um, because then we won't be able to look at feeder patterns, we won't be able to look at the whole picture and see where, where students should, should but it possibly. But sounds like this isn't I ideal but that Jamestown could probably cope for one more year the probably wouldn't change too much. They're over capacity now, but yeah. the trailer's not ideal. Being over capacity is not ideal, but but it it's budget neutral if we don't do a trailer. It wouldn't be great. They're managing now. <coughs> yeah, there, there's no easy decision in, in any of these um, items. Ms. Berta, do you want to take us to the next, or are we there? Um, I'm going to actually give them enrollment information since my um, lovely colleagues over there got my back. <laughs> uh -huh. And lots of students could choose to go to Lafayette Moore Hill. <clears throat> That's right. James, yes. Jamestown. Jamestown High School next year is protected to be over capacity by 131 students, so it's a slight decrease. But looking out to the next fiscal year, in fiscal year 19, they are projected to be over capacity by 151 students. So we're trying to create a solution thinking long term about what we're seeing for forecasted enrollment. So we have a one year dip yeah. projected for If that's reality, yeah. especially with the new programs that we're putting at the mm -hmm. high schools, that is a that's a concern. But we do have redistricting right around the corner. Right. So we could revisit this mm -hmm. in short order. Is the eighty thousand dollar in one time setup cost like is that just to set up at that location? So yeah. it's okay. site work so and, it's and just permits a and leveling. Yeah. Okay. 
The next request is for the expansion of the personalized learning laptops in our middle schools to include all grade levels, eighth grade at Hornsby <coughs> Middle and Berkeley Middle, with 600 laptops being needed to complete that personalized learning program. Additionally, there's a request to support the High School Pathways program with purchasing 300 laptops, 100 for each of those student groups at the three high schools. The total impact of this budget request would be $480,000. So that include infrastructure? Mr. Landers. <clears throat> Mr. Landers, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Morning, sir. That does include infrastructure built into that cost. Um, are some additional licensing features for our wireless net network, that type of thing, as well as the uh, support costs for the warranty and bring we have a uh, support agreement with a vendor that okay. uh, has our back on I just wanted to make sure we consider that stuff. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you, sir. The next request is for our virtual learning program. We currently have a contract with a company called Edmentum to develop our WJCC internal courses that needs to continue. The cost of that is $30,000. Additionally, there is a request to increase the stipend to pay our teachers to be those VLP teachers for $100,000 with a total budget impact of $130,000. Can, can you talk about that a little bit more, Mr. Lounders? He should have stayed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've seen quite um, an upshoot in students taking blended or virtual courses um, the staff stipends to teach those courses is, has we've actually overspent what we planned for this year already yeah, yeah the stipend is what I'm interested in yeah Mr. Landers good, good morning again good morning. Um, yes to give you an idea the 2014-15 school year our virtual program supported 135 enrollments in 15 courses. Currently this year, and we're only through the first semester, we have 306 enrollments in 25 courses. So we have seen a significant growth in that program. So why do we pay a stipend? Yeah, what's the stipend for? Um, the stipends vary based on the number of enrollment, number of students in the course. Mm -hmm. uh, the lowest stipend is $1,000. That takes you up to, I believe, eight students. The highest stipend amount we have right now, supporting 31 students, is $4,800. And so can you, what is that, what is that person who's receiving the stipend doing with the VLP program? They, they are actually, um, presenting the course. They're, they're uh, monitoring their, the word I'm looking for is escaping me at the moment, but they are the teacher of record for that course. They work, uh, work directly with the students, taking them through all of the course content, uh, doing the grading, doing the evaluations. They are the teacher for that course. And that's on top of their regular teaching duties? It, it's it's uh, treated as an additional section. So yes, it's, it's another course for that teacher in addition to their regular teaching day. So, so the, a student's taking a virtual class, they're, they, they're doing it at a house or somewhere at the, at the school? They, they could be doing it at school, they could be doing it at home. It's treated as a, nor, most of them are treated as so, a fifth block So course. then they have to have a test or whatever, and this teacher proctors and grades the test and yes, wh answers whatever any the, questions that the student might have? Yes, whatever that, that course requirement is, could, okay. be, a, could be assessments, <coughs> exams, uh, Above quizzes. and beyond what their normal teaching duties are at Lafayette or Warhill or whatever. The yes, sir. Okay. So if this program continues to grow, what's the capacity for our current teaching staff to handle that growth? Um, I don't know that I can answer that. I, I could try to do some analysis on that. Uh, basically, we are looking at the overall course because we saw sub such a significant jump this year. Um, and as you know, the person that has been responsible for this has recently taken another position. So as that replacement comes in, we're going to conduct a full analysis of that. Right now, there are only eight courses on the, within the plan to be um, revised, created, to add to our current virtual course load. Uh, that will be, ta be taking place over the next two years. So there, we do have a planned addition of courses but we want to take a further look at that, at you know, what should the caps to those courses be, what do we do if we only have a handful of students register and we don't meet that cap, 
um, taking that into account, again, you know, what does that student need for graduation? It could be that one student has to have that course to graduate, but nobody else is enrolled. What do we do in that instance? So we are going to be taking a hard look at this over this coming spring. Thank you. What is the profile of the typical student that participates in this? It varies. Uh, some of the courses are for remediation. If a student has been struggling they, and they need to uh, to make up that credit. Some of them are first time credit. Some of them are for um, advancing um, within their studies. So the, the profile really varies from remediation all the way up to advancing. In some cases it's offering courses that we don't offer in the regular classroom and so we're able to offer them via virtual or blended learning instead. <clears throat> it's really part of that whole individualized instruction and offering options for students. So if we don't build, if we don't add this $130,000 in the budget, then mm -hmm. we're basically holding steady where we currently are in terms of our offerings. Well, uh, at a minimum, we would need to continue the $30,000 contract with Edmentum because that is an agreement we entered this current year right. um, to continue the development of those courses. However, if the stipend cost was not agreed to by the board, we would need to take a hard look at how we allow students to enroll in that program and, and cap those out. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think we'd have to put some pretty significant caps on some of the courses. Yeah, we'd also have to look at our current program of studies about to be approved at the next board meeting and maybe even reduce some of the offerings very quickly if we don't have the resources to make it happen for students. And the stipend, it says increased by 100000 Right now the budget is for the stipend cost for the program? 60000 so it's 160. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I could we could add two FTEs because of the course offerings that the teacher has to be proficient in the. Correct. So uh, it's not like I could, I could just put two people on payroll and handle it. I'd have to. It's still correct. They they have to be part. certified within their area. Gotcha. Um, can, if I can go back to the previous item, the personalized learning laptops. What happens if we don't put that 480? Um, well, then we will have some seventh grade students at Berkeley and Hornsby that will be moving up to eighth grade that would not have those laptops available, or the other option would be allow them to take those forward, but then backfilling sixth grade. The incoming sixth grade class would not have laptops. So we're, we're basically short one grade level at each of those two schools. And um, I remember uh, Tina coming and telling us uh, about the pilot program and how that was working in the data. So can you just tell us a little bit about how a couple years later that's going in the middle schools? Um, the, the feedback we've, we've had has been very supportive of the, uh, of the program. The, the students, the comments that we've gotten back from them are that they, they like to have them for uh, a wide range of reasons. They keep track of their schedule. They're able to access resources at home that normally they wouldn't be able to. Uh, the teachers have truly gone above and beyond integrating into the day-to-day -day lesson plan. So, and even from the parents' perspective, um, you know, the only complaints that we've really had have been that you know a little extra weight to the backpack. But outside of that, they love having them. Um, the the way the students are treating the laptops, I'm very pleased with that. Our breakage rate has been minimal, less than two percent over the past couple of years. So the students are really taking care of the devices. Mm -hmm. So all in all, it's been a very positive program. In, in terms of in the experience students are having with their learning and personalized learning, yep. like, like anything. Well, they they. As far as being able to conduct research, that has been one of the big response areas that they, they like being able to have that tool to really be able to do the additional research that it provides. Yes. Um, and, you know, just the, the digital resources, you know, it, it fits that age group the way they like to take in information and having the digital resource in front of them, they, they enjoy that format. Yeah. Thank you. What can we anticipate or will be our long-term cost if we continue? Well, I, I've been working on that, and I, I believe we we're going to bring some information shortly. Yeah, uh, we've, we've actually um, looked. We have a three-year replacement cycle that's been in place for a long time within our division. And because of the increasing devices and because of budget constraints, we actually uh, have a plan in place to go to a four-year replacement cycle for all technology starting next year. 
and there will be some cost savings we've actually built into the, the overall cost over four years um, insurance and backup for all those devices and we think it's going to keep a lot of the pieces this year in technology cost neutral except for these new devices to, to fill out the program. What we're looking to do is provide a an estimated level um, level funding amount from year to year because uh, over the past few years it, it, it's fluctuated greatly depending on what level we were refreshing. The elementary, because we have nine buildings, has always cost quite a bit more than our middle school. But then at the same time we've been ex trying to expand the numbers with this one-to-one. -one. So I've looked at a four-year plan that the board will be able to count on. This is the amount of funding year to year to year to sustain that program. And that's been a huge conversation this year to set us up for success over the long term and no sticker shock with yeah. technology. So the, technology. the projection that I've been running is actually a four-year refresh cycle that will allow us to grow into this personalized learning one-to-one -one program at all of secondary, including the high school. Well, in terms of equity, it certainly ensures a level playing field so that we know that all of our students have the same um, access to technology and digital research. And do we also see any kind of savings at all in um, textbooks as a result, not having to purchase maybe some textbooks that we would have to purchase because... Well, there, there's, oh, still no. going to be, there's still going to be a cost associated because whether you buy the paper version mm -hmm. or the electronic mm -hmm. version, you yeah, still I mean, have there, to buy I that resource. I didn't know whether it was a one-to-one -one correlation or whether the electronic versions are a little less expensive. Or, um, no. 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 They figured that out. <laughs> yeah, <they laughs> Any other questions on the technology? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Landers. The next request is for the expansion of the early college program through Thomas Nelson for our high schools. The budget impact for this request is ninety thousand um, dollars. Question: about is, is the early college program the program that currently only War Hill students have access to? That's correct, and uh, it has increased greatly in the last two years at Warhill as a pilot program and we're bringing it into, Jam into Jamestown and Lafayette High School next year. Um, capping it at 50 students at Warhill and 25 in the other two schools because this will be their first year in the program. Um, and we've actually looked at even the funding mechanism for this so we can try to sustain it over time and I know Mr. Paula has a little bit more information on that piece of the puzzle. Uh, as Jeff, uh, Dr. Carroll launched the program, we were paying 50% of the courses. We can't do that over time with if, as numbers increase and in going to TNC to take courses. And so we're looking at uh, funding the first six hours for students instead, credit hours. Yes, go ahead. Good morning. Um, last year, Warhill had an enrollment of 43 students in their early college. Uh, what we're looking to do, as Dr. Heron said, is uh, extend the cap to 50 at Warhill and 25 at Jamestown and Lafayette so that we will have equal access to all three schools to the early college program. Um, in order for us to, to sustain this, we can provide funding for up to six credit hours for each student, um, which is roughly half of the credit hours that most of our students are taking. Um, we've had some students that take up to 15 or 18, but the majority of our students are taking 12 credit hours. So uh, we'll be able to fund um, 100 students at this particular price for next year. I, I'm really glad you guys are expanding it to the other two high schools. I think that's really important. Well, we're very excited to give that opportunity. We've had, as you know, inquiries from both other schools. And the program went from about 16 students last year to 43 at War Hill this year. So there's definitely interest. So will there be transportation costs associated with that? Or are we assuming that those students are going to drive themselves to Thomas Nelson? Well, they're seniors, so there is an assumption that they would be driving themselves. And, and students the right now walk from War Hill. Well, exactly. But there's also on their on the bus bus routes as well. Are they also um, these options online courses at Thomas Nelson? I believe they're they actually go to Thomas Nelson and take the courses. So, so they'll not, be full time. It's not just 
you've got access to the yeah. Thomas Nelson catalog, and you, if you can't get there, you can. No, they, they really become Thomas Nelson students in the <coughs> final semester, and yet they're still considered a high school <coughs> student and have access to everything they have in high school as well. So it's the best of both worlds, and yet they're gaining college credit. Um, it, it's, it's, again, another pathway for students to, to be successful. Um, so the $90,000 is essentially writing a check to Thomas Nelson? Essentially, yes. Yeah. Um, and can... Do, when student, do we have any students who enroll in um, these programs and then fail? Um, um, I don't. From last year, we did not. Uh, okay. We have students that just started last week in this semester, their spring semester at Thomas Nelson, and so we'll, we'll track how they do. But what we've seen from last year is our students are really successful. They're motivated. They want to be there. They choose to be there. Okay. Can there be an option that if they don't pass? It's not paid for. <coughs> we could look into that, of course. Or, a, or like a, a, a threshold is so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, you're better. So the, uh, so the classes at Thomas Nelson that are, are free to, us, to our students, they don't pay for them? Oh, they pay for them. There's, we pay six credit hours and they pay balance. Okay. Yep. And textbooks and fees associated with textbooks. And what happens if we don't fund the 90000 It stays at Warhill and at 50 students. Um, it would have to be found, the money would be found from other places because we currently did not budget um, money. Last year, the program didn't really exist. It had 17 <coughs> students. We were able to find money. This year, we did the same thing. We found money by not providing other services, some professional development services. Uh, so if we did not budget the 90000 then we'd have to continue Warhill, um, but have to find that money someplace else. And we could have the program and not offer any incentives to students, but it likely would diminish the program, but it still sure. could exist, but students would right. pay for it. Would that, pay that is an option also. Yes. Because you're putting caps on it. So let's say there were 30 students who met the criteria at Lafayette who wanted to participate, and we've capped it at 25. So or would we tell these other five, no, you can't do it? Or we could say, you, you could still do it, but you have to pay 100%? Or would we reallocate the funding and say, we'll give everyone three credit hours at Cal? We, How we, those five? Yeah, we can yeah. certainly look. Uh, if we end up in that position, we'll, we'll find a way to, to, to best uh, work with students. Um, I think because of this smaller pilot the first year at, at Warhill with only 14 or 15 mm -hmm. coming through, we're hoping that that will accommodate most interested students in the first year, but we do anticipate it growing as the word gets out. Um, and there's a possibility that we'll have 45 students at Warhill, but we have a total pool of a possible 100 mm -hmm. total students from WJCC. Um, I, I would, if you don't already, I'd appreciate it if the division would create an opportunity for families who can afford to pay full ride to do that, you know, so that it could make the pot more robust for families who can't. Who, who can't. Mm -hmm. We so, can look into that. Um, we yeah, have so discussed with Thomas yeah. Nelson that there is no um, financial aid currently offered for students because they're not full-time Thomas sure. Nelson students as far as matriculating in their WJCC students. But we can look into what the possibility is for those that can fund it fully versus those that need support. And also, how does that eventually impact, for example, Jamestown's overcrowdedness? So if you, if you can see this being a program that's growing, it, it could kind of help with some of our pressures. I think if it grows incredibly, yes, there'll, there'll, there'll be a, a tipping point in the program. But at the moment, we have individual school students coming from several different classes, so it doesn't mm -hmm. impact our ratio of teachers right now, but as the program grows, yes, it, it could. It could impact. Plus, we would have 25 students in Jamestown potentially off-site for a semester. And has Thomas Nelson given us any break at all? No. Because when th the vision a long, long time ago when we ended up selecting that site for Warhill was for Thomas Nelson to come and for us to have this collaborative partnership. That was the vision 10 plus years ago. Um, so what are they doing for us? <laughs> but we, we do partner? we do have access to other programs and we do partner in other ways, but this is one area that 
we've agreed that they put, we pay full tuition. And again, it's a pilot program where we'll be monitoring it, we'll be looking at the data, we'll bring you back information, number of students, um, cost factors and potential growth and types of classes they took. We'll, we'll certainly provide you information to let you know where, where this goes over time. Thank you. The next request is to increase the budget by $190,000 to support the purchase of replacement high school science and middle school and high school social studies textbooks. The last time these texts were purchased was 2003. Oh, wow. So they're quite dated. Are these all hard copy books or electronic ones as well? There are all the hard ones. Let's have all. electronic versions. <laughs> Good morning again. Um, we have not done the full textbook adoption process. We usually don't give the green light for the full process until we think that we have the funding because it's quite laborious. Uh, we're looking at both digital and paper copies of all textbooks. And as uh, Mr. Landers said, there is a cost associated with our digital. Normally, we'll try to do a class set of the actual hard copy textbooks to save some money, but there is an individual student license for the digital. So there, if there's a cost savings, it may be minimal, but we can't tell right now. Um, hard copies of textbooks can go anywhere from $75 to 125 and so we'll look very, very closely. I've asked the coordinators that when they start the process that we come up with one digital option and one hard copy option. One of the nice things is many of our hard copy textbooks have digital resources that are available to students. But at, as Mrs. Berta said, that we have last bought textbooks in 2003, and that you know that in social studies and science, we've made some slight changes <laughs> since that time. <laughs> so the 190,000 gets um, social studies and science textbooks. At, what does that cover? Um, do you want to say what the addition was from? The current budget for textbooks is 160000 so this provides a total of $350,000 to support this, this budget, but the additional amount requested is 190000 And right. some, of, some of this money is um, kind of reinstatement for money that we did not, we took out of the budget previously. Um, social studies, we're looking at 7th um, grade social studies, U.S. history, and 11th grade U.S. Virginia history. In science, we're looking at chemistry, physics, AP physics, field biology, and oceanography. Um, this kind of complements the previous purchases we've done in science and, the, and social studies in so the that, past. That 350k accomplishes all of that. Let's hope so. <laughs> and the, the last time all those were bought was in 2003. 2003. Correct. If you remember last year, we ended up with textbooks in the end of year spending plan because we didn't have it in the budget. So the kid, so the kids using these class, these textbooks were in first grade when we bought them. Correct. Obviously, we have supplemented <laughs> a lot of instruction Is with primary sources and digital resources. And teachers have been amazing at being able to gather things um, that supplement the gap between 2003 and 2016. You know, we're hoping that we can provide them with a, a textbook that will not be. Out, as outdated as the ones we have now. So this would cover all of the science courses at, at high school, or, or would there still be other sci some science courses that would be using books from 2003? There'll be a couple of AP courses that'll be um, using books. Um, these are the greatest needs and the oldest textbooks that we have. Likewise for social studies, there would, or, or middle school would be up to date. Uh, middle school still needs to have seventh grade uh, sorry, eighth grade coming up in the future. Um, let's see, World History 1, World History 2 is, we're looking for the next cycle of textbook adoption. And then we have coming down the line both math and English language arts for elementary and secondary are in the middle of revisions for their standards. So in fiscal year 19, 20, and 21, we're going to be looking at textbooks for them as well. In, uh, in the mode of thinking on a different paradigm, do they want textbooks? Um, we have actually, in some content areas, phased out textbooks. For example, in fine arts and world languages, our curriculum is completely based on using supplemental 
uh, resources. Uh, we are, that's part of the discussion as we go through the adoption, is do we want to put the money in actual textbooks or digital resources or create our own? Yeah, because I mean, I'm looking at, it's 2017 now, they were 20, so in 2031, what are, they, what are you gonna be doing then? And just to give you an example, with world languages, we, we are using um, digital resources that constantly need to be updated, but they've chosen to go with a very oral proficiency-based curriculum and they go out and find primary sources of videos and language um, that's in the target language, newspapers and magazines. So it is very labor intensive for both the teachers and the content coordinators, but that's an option for us to discuss. Right. I just appreciate that that's part of our thinking, our, our routine thinking that, that uh, you know, because maybe the teachers don't want it. So it's good, thank you. <clears throat> the next request is for an assessment and analytical tool for our special programs department. This tool merges student data and information from multiple systems that we currently have into one efficient platform for a review. The cost impact of that system and that tool is $40,000. <coughs> so is there anybody here who can generate some excitement for that $40,000? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Thor. <laughs> you have just made an incredible request, Mr. Kelly. Thanks, Mr. Kelly. Now he's got a smile on his You have just set him up for success. So this is uh, this is very exciting. However, I, I, I will I will tell you that the, the type of data analytics tool about which we're proposing here is not an assessment tool. It will assess no students what whatsoever, but it does house historical assessment data, uh, attendance data, uh, discipline data, as well as any kind of smaller assessments along the way that students will complete that could help our end users at the school level to have all of that information at once to make decisions <laughs> best about what students need. So this interacts with our student information system, That's right. the data, yes. and then, and so can you help us understand how this would help student achievement? Sure, I'll just, I'll give you a, I might give you more than you bargained for, but I'll give you just one example that's kind of timely with something that we've been doing now. So if we're looking to find seventh graders that are reading below grade level, we can easily get that information from one or two sources. However, if we want to know why that might be happening, we might want to know, are there any discipline reasons? Has the student missed 12 or more days of school? What kind of smaller assessments has she or he taken that could give us some more information about what they need next. In order to do that now, we have to pull from three or four or more programs, which is extremely labor intensive, and for teachers and specialists and administrators at the school level, their time needs to be spent on kids, whereas with a data analytics tool, that can all be that information can all be compiled and ready for end users at the central office and the school level within minutes. Is this something like Tableau? It's a data visualization tool? Uh, I'm not familiar with that tool, but... It's what it does. Okay. I, I'm just wondering if there are other options out there that might be less expensive than $40,000 that basically take data from different places and then you create your visualization as you need it. Sure. And we, we certainly, with proposed funding, we would be going out with an R, for an RFP to see what's the best tool available. Um, it's from this we can actually have a work early warning system by taking data from several sources and really intervene with students where they need the intervention. And we use several sources of data to bring it together. Um, most school systems have this kind of analytic tool. We've been looking at it for a period of time and, and it's important to us. Uh, is this a one-time cost? There would be recurring costs uh, from the verbal quotes that we received. It would be anywhere from twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year in recurring costs. Okay. What's the name of the company? We've had we've had a couple quotes. There's eScholar, Power School Assessment and Analytics. Again, we would if we actually had this proposed in the superintendent's budget for next year, we would go through the procurement process. So the recurring costs are, all, are almost as much as the initial cost? We're not yes. absolutely sure, but we would anticipate some annual cost. That would certainly be something we would negotiate 
with whoever was selected during the RFP process to determine. And does this replace any, could it potentially replace any, any current service that we have in assessment? I think it would help to um, better utilize the assessment information that we have. I'm, I'm not sure that this could duplicate anything that we have. Would this help the division better understand whether or not interventions it's using are working or not? Yes. Mr. Thorpe has done well in generating excitement for his $50,000. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Thorpe. <laughs> Since it's forty thousand dollars, it's under forty thousand. Mm -hmm. In a way, mm -hmm. should you decide you want to go with this, you don't. It's not current. Right. It's, it's not currently in the budget, but it is a. If it if there's a recurring cost, we would need to account for that in budgets yep. moving forward. And so whether it's that amount or less moving forward, we would need to have it captured somewhere. And in a budget of our size, sometimes it is particularly if you're trying something new and want to pilot something and be nimble, finding 20, 40,000 can be done, but our budget this year is super tight. Um, and, you know, a bunch of 40,000s add up quickly, fast. We keep asking Miss Berta to look in her pot of gold, but there, at some point there won't be anything left. Um, I have to remind them all the time that I don't have a magic pot. I make magic happen with their pots. So. <laughs> yeah. That's well stated. Yeah. Oh, yes. We're, we're used to that statement. <laughs> that concludes the non-personnel request. You do have nine to choose from, and Betsy will let us know. We have five dots. Five dots left. Our last dots. Oh, so <laughs> place the five on the nine. Oh, yeah. Oh, is this a good time to take the break? So after everybody votes, why don't we take a five-minute recess? Okay? Mrs. Young, is that okay? That's Recess. That's a good term. That's a program. Procedure As the parliamentarian, I figured that Thank you, Madam Parliamentarian. Good Lord. <laughs>
snow removal. Or was trying to make Marcel's life so bad. Is everybody ready? <laughs> we just wanted to, uh, we just wanted the sun to come out and melt it. Yes. That'll remove it. So. So I understand from Ronnie that our voices are being picked up nicely in the mics, so that's good. But I, um, some requests from the audience to speak a little bit um, loud, louder because um, it's difficult to hear in the back of the room. So if we could do that, that'd be great. All right, the next several items that we're going to talk about don't require your ranking, but we would request that you have some discussion about them so that we can make sure that we are heading in the direction that is the desire of the board. The first being redistricting, hiring a consultant and developing a redistricting plan. Um, we have spoken and reviewed some other districts redistricting cost and we do anticipate that to cost the division approximately $150,000 um, in order to accomplish that. Um, so I guess if we can get a sense of direction of the board to make sure that these are appropriate to include in the budget. That would be helpful for us as we develop the superintendent's proposed budget um, with us having estimated cost at this point in time. Um, I think we need to pay a consultant for the GIS data um, for uh, different scenarios about where people, uh, you know, like what makes sense geographically and what makes sense for transportation purposes. I don't think we need to pay a consultant for some kind of a citizen's task force creation and all, all of those kind of things that we did back in 2007, I believe. I would be opposed to that level of, uh, of consulting. That's just my, my I, take on that. I agree with Julie 100%. So with that notion, does that reduce the cost? with what Julie just said? It would, um, and I don't know how significantly, um, but I know one of the school divisions that we looked at was Arlington because they recently went through this yeah. and this is how we based our mm -hmm. our estimated cost off of. So they, they did go through a pretty substantial um, redistricting process in their division. And this is only for middle school? That would be a decision the board would want to make. Um, but 150 wouldn't get us high school, middle school, and elementary. Would just We would have to go through that procurement process to figure sure. that out. I mean, there may be companies out there that are willing to do all three if that is the direction of the board. Um, I concur that I wouldn't want a replication of uh, previous redistricting <coughs> processes, but I, I do, I am interested in a more full-service full uh, firm that's capable of garnering school board priorities, uh, uh, community priorities, and then using GIS to translate those priorities into recommendations that this board can use. So I, I would be, so not just the functionality of mapping, but also some prioritization and, and, um, and reflecting that prioritization in mapping. So I, I am interested in something a little bit more robust than, than a mapping function, um, particularly if we embark on anything uh, beyond middle school. I don't know what everybody. Any other comments? Oh, I, th I think I'd like them especially to uh, include a look at the high school since we're looking at overcrowding at Jamestown. I, I think that what we, the school board's main function is approving budgets, doing redistricting, and um, policy or on policy so this is one of our core responsibilities that I don't I personally don't want to delegate that core responsibility out to some consultants well and I think historically that hasn't worked very well so we no, paid haven't. we paid for the consultants and then in the end the school board rewrote the maps so um, again just to reiterate I think we need the GIS data mm -hmm. um, maybe we need some additional support but um, I'd like to see the, this number go down. I think we do need to look broader than just middle school in light of capacity issues. Um, Arlington seems to me that it would be significantly bigger than our division. Like, so you'd like you base this number on Arlington's most recent redistricting, but there's a lot bigger Ms. than us. Ms. Overcamp Smith actually did some of the research for this, so I'm going to ask her to speak to that. Thank you. 
Good morning. Uh, we also looked at Alexandria, which is more closely aligned to our numbers and the number of schools. And it was the same price. Yes. And was it just for one school level, like middle school, or was it for all three? It was across the board. Across the board. But also that's having them create the maps, which is what we're saying. So there, there could be some cost reduction there if we do more of the work. Yeah, could you explain perhaps what those... What, what services you looked at? Um, this is a full service. It includes gathering all of the community input, um, gathering the will of the board and the desires of the board, as well as the GIS, GIS mapping, and then the discussions about the maps, and then alterations of the maps based on input. It's full service. I mean, I think we should have the consultant. I'll worry about scope and scope later, but you know, we should definitely right. budget for it. There are many pieces of this that we don't have the capacity in house to do right. and to do well. So you're suggesting this is the maximum amount, you wouldn't go over this and you're just wanting us to say yay or nay? That's the thought process, yes. We don't really say yay or nay on this, right? Is this well, you're, you're giving us you're some direction okay. now, just do you want us to budget for redistricting, which I think we, yeah. Yeah. we yes. have to do. Yes. We have to. So yes. it's just a, a, to yes. get some sense of what your priorities would be as we go out in an RFP and the parameters of that. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get more detailed input from you in that process. Right, this number we have to approve it, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Yay, Verley. Next. The next item is, uh, as you know, we are in the fifth year of our strategic plan and it is due for a redesign and creation. The recommendation from staff is to include $30,000 to get support to ensure that we develop that next five year strategic plan um, with the input from board and. Why does that cost 30000 we were trying to find out what it cost last time. I'm not sure we got a price on that, but I think it was significantly more to get a lot of community input. I do think we've some data points already to start recreating because we've just gone through a process asking a large number of uh, people in the community about our strengths and challenges in the superintendent search process. So we have some input, I think, that could be used already as a data point in, this, in the new strategic plan. Um, but we're not sure what else it will involve to reauthorize and rewrite and get it up and running for next year. Uh, uh, is this cost for like a consultant that does this? Potentially to be determined. We just know we may need some assistance in, in, in developing and creating the new, the new process and plan. What what would happen or is it possible to delay the creation of a a new strategic plan um, for a year and ask staff to develop strategies and tactics around the existing um, goals of the plan. Um, I mean, the goals are broad enough where um, perhaps with redistricting and um, new superintendent coming on board, um, if it's not. Um, I think there's more. There's a lot more expertise to do this process in house than there is the previous one. Yeah, but for thirty thousand dollars, you're only going to get so much help from outside. I mean, that's the same price to be roughly paid for our superintendent search firm. Um, you know, I think it's important that you have a budget in there for for any kind of potential uh, outside services that you're that you're looking for. Um, we're going to have a new superintendent that's going to be coming on board and it's going to need going to want to put his own spin or her own spin on a strategic plan so I just think it's important that we have that in the budget and uh, once again figure out scope like to get to that get to that point so I think so. having a having a number like 30,000 on a 130 million dollar budget I don't think is is an unreasonable expectation I think this is a, a minimalist approach to it in terms of resources and it may not be all needed But it's also a budget number, so I mean, at, some, at some point maybe you need more and then we come back and we look at it. So, Absolutely. But for a budget and a plan, I think it's, I think it's a, good, a good number to have in there. I liked Kira's idea. 
when we're looking at that's half the cost of the playground at DJ. So I think when we have to <coughs> we're making a budget, thirty thousand is not a lot in some respects, but um, we have a lot of things coming down the pike um, with redistricting. Okay. <coughs> I, I do have a question about the State Department of Education. Is this a requirement that we're on a cycle? That every five years we have to, we have to develop a, a new strategic plan. Um, I don't think there was a very formal strategic plan before Dr. Constantino, and I think it was formalized and with a lot of community input uh, over five years ago. Um, I, I think there there is a possibility that could be readjusted and relooked at to continue for another year, no, if one, necessary. One other, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, Dr. Heron. But one of my questions is, you, you were talking about data points. I mean, have the, the data that we've, we've received, has it changed the, uh, do you perceive that it's changed the focus of the strategic plan? And, um, um, I think there there's a lot of opportunity to rewrite what we have and make it a lot more focused. Okay. That, and there's certainly a great opportunity to put a whole piece in to do with management and fiscally, uh, fiscally responsible management of resources and efficiencies in the business side of the operation, which doesn't exist right now. And you could do that in-house? We certainly mm -hmm. could readjust and add priorities and refocus it absolutely with some of the expertise we have. It, it's just my sense that this, this division, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Kelly, that budgeting it, it, it is a good idea. I just, I'm thinking about <coughs> July 1 of this year uh, versus July 1 of next year, and I just think this division will be more, and this board will be more well positioned to really get their arms around our, and create a high quality strategic plan 18 months from now, um, uh, rather than six months from now. Um, because, yeah. Because, you know, to Dr. Heron's point, I, I agree that the the existing plan could be improved. Uh, um, and having served on that committee, um, you know, I watched that sausage being made, and um, and and I just think it would be better for this to, to hold off on that a little bit and really and really embrace <coughs> it after new superintendents on board for a while after um, we've redistricted, and, and hopefully after we're out of this, hopefully after we've hit bottom financially. Well, I mean, uh, I think we're kind of overdue when we look at, look at that strategic, strategic plan. I thought we should do it a year ago. Um, I don't think it gets better like a fine wine does. I mean, I think we need to, yeah, and it's a plan. <clears throat> you can always change a plan in midstream. I mean, you know, as Eisenhower said, the first thing they, the first thing out the window is a plan when you go to war. So. I mean, <laughs> We should, you know, we should, uh, I mean, I, I just think that we should do it, obviously wait, wait till a superintendent comes on board, but a year and a half from now is a long year and a half. Because that doesn't help, does it? <laughs> um, did you want to vote on that, to not vote officially, but to give us individual input to move forward and keep it in the budget or not. I mean, I do think, as, as Mr. Kelly has mentioned, um, with the transition about to take place, we're, we're not leaving the new person with a lot of resources to use if they wish to move the system forward much more quickly than a year and a half. Okay, so you're saying keeping this in the budget would give the new superintendent <coughs> comes on July 15th, right? You said that. Uh, the, the, say, a tool that would allow uh, her or him to sure. Well, it's your, you propose the budget and we figure it out, so you know, okay. we've kind of got the, the gamut here. Okay, okay. Thank you. The next request is for translation services for division documents. Um, it has become evident that with the growing population of English language learners in our division, we don't always do the best job of communicating in their language to make it understandable from the division level with our documents. Um, we have done some research and determined that the cost for that, that translation service would be approximately $25,000. Um, to support that so we can begin that process of better communicating with those those English language learners. 
would this be something that you would have um, all of the needed documents that are on the website available in different languages, not just Spanish, but? Our expert's going to return <laughs> to answer those questions. Hello. <laughs> Uh, our division website, we actually have as part of our design the ability to use a tool that you can just click and you can translate it. So this is primarily for our documents, for our letters to home, um, for instance, our code of conduct, our program of studies. The, app, the range for translation services is about 9 to 16 cents a word. And our um, code of conduct has 27,994 words, so that one document is $4,500 to translate. Um, it is a matter of quality translation. We obviously could put every document into Google Translate and it would be a mess. Um, guaranteed mess. Our program of studies is over 31,000 words. That would be over $5,000 just to translate that one document. Into just one language? Into Spanish. So we're just looking at Spanish because that's our biggest need right now? Yes, to at least get this started. We um, translated the letter that we sent home, uh, the, the security, safety and security letter that we sent home with all families. We did translate that, so we are taking steps to move forward, but that each document, there is a cost associated with it. I don't see how we can. I mean, a lot of the elementary school uh, uh, textbook purchases don't don't letters come with them in different languages, like when they go to a different unit. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of math because the last time I taught math, uh, every time we went to a new unit, we had Korean, a Korean letter, a Spanish letter, um, there was a Thai letter, there was a Filipino letter. I was just trying to think of, there was about eight different language letters and they were already provided by the textbook manufacturer. Those, we're not talking about those type of letters, we're, we're not. talking about other we're not talking about instructional letters, we're talking about division documents, um, letters home for things that happen in a school. Communication resources. Communication, yes. Okay. Uh, Betsy, so let's say that's, this is our cost for the big code of conduct and uh -huh. um, program of studies. Right. So let's say every time we change it, it's not going to be that much money. It'll just be... No. I'm not sure what the review cost would be, um, but there would be an associated review cost, yes but not anything to a... I would not say it would be another $5,000, unless it was a whole scale change. So it could be redlined, this is what, and then the... Potentially. Change. I, I have not asked those questions of the vendors that I've spoken with. Would schools be able to extend <laughs> this um, service to their uh, affinity groups, uh, PTAs or booster clubs or anything like that because, you know, you know or what goes out on Peach Jar? Um, we would, within the pot of money that we are allocated, reach, try to reach as many schools as many documents as we could. So yes. To answer your question, if the PTA is working on a newsletter or whatever, if we have the funds for it, um, we would definitely take a look at that. And our priority would be our two most critical Division-wide document. documents. Yeah. Those would be the two <laughs> main priorities, but those letters home, um, the division letters home, letting people know about incidents that occur, those are the ones that are falling through the cracks right now that I really would like to get started with. And the big packet that comes home the first week of school. Yes, all of that. Some of that is already translated, but again, every time you change it. Is this going to require like, that uh, a student would come in and say, What's, what language do you prefer these documents in, or that everyone gets both? That information is in, is captured in our student information management system. Um, obviously, we would not get all of our families' information that way. Some, the child may not require services, but the family is Spanish speaking. So we would make the documents readily available in a number of different places so families that aren't identified, we could have them there for them. 
So that first week of school, that big packet doesn't come home in two languages? It does not. Okay. <laughs> if we could get rid of some of that paper, that would be great. Do it. Gotta do it. Gotta do it. This is a point of reference. Uh, Mr. Snipes has just uh, informed me that the last authorization of the strategic plan was 69,000. Just as a, a point of reference uh, compared to before. The next item um, for discussion is the projected cost impact of the high school pathways program. So, um, as you know, Warhill will be entering their second year of implementation with expansion by another 100 students, and Lafayette and Jamestown would be entering their first year of implementation, each housing 100 students as currently slated. Based on that, we've communicated with the high school principals, and Warhill has identified the need to increase their teaching staff by four FTEs to support that program for an anticipated cost of 300000 Staffing for the first year of implementation at Jamestown and Lafayette also project the need for one additional FTE at each school for a total cost impact at each school of $75,000. There also have been, uh, at a high level, identified instructional resources and technology at all three high schools that are necessary to fully support that program for an anticipated cost of $75,000. And then looking at transportation to transport those uh, students that don't attend their home school uh, to another high school to participate in the Pathways program, we are anticipating the need to support transportation by an additional $60,000 <coughs> this time. The total projected need based on this information would be an impact on the budget of an additional $585,000. It's important to note that this does not include the laptop cost that we talked about earlier with Brian's request. Um, so that would be on top of the 585, but looking at staffing and instructional resources and technology, this is what we see at this current time, and it's, it's important to understand as well that Lafayette and Jamestown are still in their very early planning stages, so uh, I don't want this to be the concrete number because this <coughs> most certainly could change as they go down the path of continuing their planning year. Um, so I, I think we are looking for direction um, about the, the continuation of this program at all three high schools, um, just so you are aware of what we are anticipating the cost to be. Well, I think the Pathways program is, is good. I, I definitely want to, that seemed almost a little bit too trivial. I mean, it's, it's, it's an outstanding program. Um, but we, have, we haven't changed our enrollment at our high schools, and we're, we're adding FTEs here. Are we taking FTEs away from somewhere else? That's, that why, are, you know, as far as, if I have another 100 students going into the Pathways pro program, I'm having 100 students coming out of another program. Isn't, isn't this, shouldn't be somewhat more neutral than what I expect? Um, we had hoped it would be neutral. Um, according to Dr. Carroll, the way it's set up, we've got a physics by design, 50 students, two teachers. We've got a humanities by design, two teachers, 50 students. But what has happened, we have an, an additional class called uh, Pathways English and Pathways Math where they do blended instruction and they're covering uh, three different math uh, levels of students within 50 students in one classroom with one teacher and most of ninth and 10th grade English with one teacher in a Pathways English. And that's where it has been most difficult this year for the individual teacher to sustain it and, and move it forward. So the two, the four at Warhill would be two moving into year two and two with the new group coming in. So it really is an extra additional two staff. The Jamestown and Lafayette, it's it's a figure put out. We don't really know what that is yet because we don't have all the details of the program. They may be able to sustain it without additional staff in the first year, um, like Dr. Carroll did. Um, I think we have numbers on the number of teachers who took on an extra block this year. Mr. Yeah. Baker, we have some of that information. We want to provide some background there. In Warhill, we have teachers take on additional sections to allow the program to happen this year, which was fairly substantial. I believe uh, it was about eight teacher, eight additional blocks of teachers taking on extra blocks just to get it kind of covered with a Band-Aid uh, to make it work. 
Um, and, the, and the kids aren't coming all from nice groups of 20 or 25. So if they're taking three or four kids from a math class or three or four kids from a different math class, three or four kids from a third math class to form this other math class, they, they still need the ad additional teacher because they're not uh, they're not they're not not teaching the other classes. Right. So if I look at Warhill, where I'm, I got four FTEs being requested for its second year for FB fre freshmen and sophomores. So junior year, am I going to get another full request? And senior year, get another full request? Or? No. The, the way the program's envisioned, envisioned right now, they're, it's very different. It's like early college in the first two years. And then students are going into a number of pathways in the regular classrooms in the last two years. So we don't see, this is like a, at the moment in the pilot, it's a two-year rotating program. And then students can start to choose according to their career path. They could be going to Thomas Nelson. They could be going to AP classes. They could be going to regular classes. So I don't see that projected up. Um, also, in the initial envisioning of what's going to happen at Jamestown and Lafayette, Lafayette High School, their model is a little bit different. And I'm not sure that they're going to need the four FTEs that, that Dr. Carroll has his program is, is necessitating. But again, we're in the really early stages sure. still of planning of the, of the other two programs. Sure, I mean, I really, want, I really want us to support the Pathways program. I just want to make sure that you know, this four FTE expansion, particularly at Warhill, and, and then you know, that, be, you know, that be kind of comes a standard. So then Jamestown I have next year asked for four, and then Lafayette asked for four, and so then suddenly we've got, you know, a lot of staff, lot of and so I, I, I really want to support the Pathways program. I just want to make sure that we're being as uh, frugal and um, really putting some good granularity to the uh, to the staffing there, because that just seems like it seems like all it seems like a lot to me. It, it, it seems like a lot, and it's it's what the principals are seeing right now. Obviously, we are looking at every angle of this. Um, I think the important thing and and bringing some estimate to the board today is, is just for you and the public to realize you don't make a pro programmatic change that's cost neutral. And even though we've got seed money from the uh, Department of Education, $50,000 for Warhill and a split for the other two schools, there's not enough money that we can find in right. a very lean budget to support the programs moving forward. And we right. Just and, and, your sense of and while we want to support it, we have a lot of demands on our budget, and if it becomes to becomes an affordability issue that we have to we have to look at going forward. And, and my opinion is also, if you have a robust program that you're developing, you cannot have it at just one high school. You cannot have that level of uh, inequity to have a, a wonderful program here, and then and then not have it at the other two high schools. So you need to look at the big picture and um, if there's a more efficient way to uh, save on the FTE at War Hill, then it needs to be taken into consideration because we're gonna be adding two more high schools on. So. Absolutely. And we've also got the 300,000 uh, in the capital improvement for all of these as Correct. well. Correct, which you have approved, which we don't know if it will be approved at the next level. So there's all there's there's a lot of unknowns right now with this program. Um, based on what Mr. Baker said about other teachers taking on uh, extra classes to, to is some of this not necessarily cost attributed to pathways, but just high schools responding to students needing having needing in today's world more choices and us really holding flat for many years hiring despite the fact that we've had growing enrollment I'm just wondering how much of the extra FTs are really just pressure on growing enrollment at particularly at Warhol which has grown a lot in the last couple of years this, and then this is not for adding the student overall growth this is adding because it's it's unique and so they're Over going to be teaching it. those those classes and, and and like i said that you know if you have three or four different math classes at different levels if they only pull out two or three and, and so that other you know current teachers losing two or three they're not going to reduce a teacher because you lost two or three students i think it's to do with choice as yeah well. it's yeah. the variety and the choices yeah. what we right. do offer 
I mean, this is something obviously we're monitoring, looking at very closely, believe in the program, believe it that we do need to redesign and engage high school students. And we're trying to do it on a shoestring last year, but at some point we, we can't find in a lean budget what we need to make it happen. And I, this is not a final figure, but it's just a sense of what could be there within as well as we bring the budget back to you. And I, I just wanted to say that I mean I, I I think innovation is important. I think it's I think it we need to make sure that we have it. I don't necessarily think that we have to have three identical curriculums at all three different high schools. Right. I mean the best way to kill innovation is to, is to multiply it by three when you're trying to trying to figure out what kind of your budget for it, right? Um, but you know <coughs> if we if we have a pathways program at Warhill, and that's the only place where we can afford it. And Jamestown students have to go to Warhill, and that's the choices that they have to make. And it has to, because we don't have the uh, unlimited budget, so I mean, I, I, I think that uh, you know we have to make sure that we're still supporting uh, innovation and teaching and learning in our schools. And I think if we look at that as a possibility or a potential direction from the board. We're in a planning phase at Jamestown and Lafayette. The program has not started. We're not impacting students. So if you were to say we can only afford to do this at one school and transport everyone who needs to wants to go there, there's a time for doing that and there's a time beyond. It's difficult to do that because we're actually going to impact students who start a program. Um, again, we're not fully funded even in the seed grant from the State Department and the other two high schools. I guess just to, to Julie's point, when we're looking at the three schools and we're looking at equity, regardless of program, I think we need to make sure that that resources are equal. I mean, programs conceivably will look different, um, but I think if we're looking at giving more dollars to one school versus some other schools, and when you look at demographics, and test scores and SOL scores and, and a certain school is getting less dollars and, and they have the highest dropout rate and the lowest test scores, I have a problem with that. So I, I guess two, two comments. If, if we are currently running pathways on a shoestring, I'm wondering if we can run it on two shoestrings next year. <laughs> um, so because that's... I think more than two shoestrings sh and, and jumping to four FTs is, uh, is, is a little bit, I, I realize that I appreciate knowing the real cost and that this is probably conservative, it probably is higher. This is very conservative for the program, potentially when we add a second year. But, but I think it is, I take it as a, a wake up call to what it really costs to add programming and I think, and I struggle with parity between, you know, with the high schools and with equity, because I believe those are two different things. Um, and I think that we have tried over the years historically to, to be equal, but the schools aren't equal. No, no school is a, a, anywhere. Um, and so I, 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 I just, I'm concerned that we may find ourselves in a situation that in order to allow for innovation and in order to allow students to um, get the resources that they need to succeed educationally in our system, we may not be able to provide the kind of parity that we, we've endeavored to and we may have to start allowing students to travel. To, to seek the resources that best fit their learning style, their learning needs, and there may then result different in differences of, between the high schools. Um, and I don't think lack of parity equates to lack of equity, and I think equity is something that I, I believe strongly in and, and want to achieve. Um, I think those are two different things. That helps. Thank you very much. I mean, does anyone, do you have the, I guess I have two comments about this. Number one, one of the things that I liked most 
about uh, Pathways program is that we're actually preparing kids for the real world. Uh, and that's been a huge complaint from the business community for many years, that kids come out with unrealistic um, experiences, expectations, work, worth at, uh, work ethics, everything. So I um, actually am a huge supporter of this program. I, I do think that if we're going to do this program, it needs to be offered at all the high schools because I do think that there will be interest. And we're, we're actually, uh, for preparing children for 21st century, um, the workplace, I think that we're doing them, um, we would be doing them a disservice if we didn't help them as much as possible prepare for, for the workplace. On the other hand, then you have to also think about, uh, um, I would imagine eventually that this would level out somehow in my thinking. I think we would eventually find a point where needing more staff would be less of a, a concern because you're going to be taking more kids into the program, so maybe other staff would eventually be allocated to that program. But, I mean, it's in such an early stage right now, we really don't have a full picture. It's an unknown, as uh, Dr. Heron said. but. Um, a half a million dollars is a lot of money. So, and, and I want to be clear, I would love to have this program at all three high schools. Love it. <clears throat> I, I, but the state isn't giving us the resources, and so that, that's where the conflict comes in for me. It's, it's about resources. But at this point, we, have, we are going to have some kind of program at all three high schools. It, moving forward, we've taken, we've accepted the grant, which is a planning grant, half a grant, uh, for each of our other two high schools. Um, there possibly will be what Warhill had, was, which is an implementation grant, but again, Warhill uh, got 50,000. What the other two schools will get from the state will be 25 and 25 for the planning phase, which is why it may cost a little bit more. Um, so yes. Where we're going on a trajectory right now, we will have a program at all three high schools next year. And every single one of those has a, has a foundation of the portrait of a graduate, which is where high school education is going and the whole vision for the future coming down from the Department of Education. So I don't think we're off base in what we're doing at all. I think we're actually ahead of other systems because we're thinking about the right things, we're putting the emphasis on the right things, but it just comes at a cost. And, and really the purpose of this today is to say we, there are a lot of uncertainties and there is a cost involved, but I'm hearing the will of the board to continue to do it, yes. but to really look at every possible avenue to save, to save money in the process, but, but still do it with fidelity. Can, can we send an, a letter to the Department of Education <coughs> thanking them for the grant, but also saying, you know, it's wonderful for you for to give us $50,000, but... Well, but it's costing us half a million, mm -hmm. just, just so you know. Well, it is the idea of eventually, long term, that this becomes the new high school, right? The new high school way of teaching. So it, it's pathways for everyone, right? Is that the ultimate goal? With, within our system, um, I think the focus on project-based learning, on blended learning, on allowing students to explore careers, of having internships, all of that has got to be part of the future of high school uh, to really keep students engaged. So we're incorporating and aware of all of that. So it, it really is a good thing, but we're, we're, we're balancing a lot of priorities right now and that's where we're struggling you know, to make decisions even today or to get your input today. I'd like to see us continue to move forward with all three high schools, mm -hmm. and, and maybe there can be some uh, competition with efficiency on um, having three different three different high schools <coughs> looking into how it can be done and, and seeing what, what's the most efficient way to provide it. I don't want to have a situation where just based on where you're districted, you have to, in order to participate in a program like like this, that we are considering the future for everyone, that you would have to leave your home school to go to another home school, leave your sports team, leave, you know, all of those kind of implications just because you're not districted to a particular school. And that brings up another 
possibility. At the moment, we're saying every program's open to every student, and any school student can travel to any high school if we have something at all three schools in a pilot situation, should they stay at their home school. But each pilot looks significantly different, which is required by this, the, the Virginia DOE. That's correct. So if it's not available to all students, then it limits options. That's very true. But the idea would ultimately be you stay at your home school. You have a pathway to so stay at your home school. Well, I think what's been developed thematically is very different. So for mm -hmm. example, Jamestown will focus and will have a, a large number of their projects around medical sciences. Mm -hmm. And, and Warhill at the moment is very much towards the engineering, <coughs> IT side of things, and um, Lafayette is focused on business and leadership and entrepreneurship. So they, they do have different <coughs> bases for the programs, and, and they will, they'll have some things that are very similar, project-based learning, internships, um, blended learning, um, career exploration, but they all have some things that will be the same, they'll all be under the banner of Pathways, which really is our, our signature and our, our branding of the program, but within the structure in the middle, they will look very different when it comes to choice for students. And when we start to have parent meetings to invite students to be part of it, those differences will be made obvious at that time to the student body. And it's really those first two years that the students are participating in the programs that they would be kind of significantly different because once they get to the junior senior level, that's when they would go back to AP classes or the specialty program at Thomas Nelson or virtual online classes. So like those last two years of high school might look more similar in terms of options. At, at this moment in time we're with the two year pilot, that's what we're thinking because we literally branch into different choice lanes for students and, and the idea is they're not a tier, it's not some are doing AP and going to college and some are doing this, they're all equally valid pathways for students to success. Okay, and there are choices, I mean we've, and, choices. and, and you know, we've spent a lot of money this morning and I'm certain that Mrs. Bird is going to tell us how much money we had to spend here shortly. You're about to have that, that moment. <laughs> we don't have. <laughs> short race. Anyway, thank you so much for, for your input. Um, I think we, we, we realize the importance, we realize we, we want our students to have what they need. We will uh, work through everything, see what we can do. Thank you. Ms. Berta. Now I will begin to review the governor's proposed budget and its projected impact on our school division. Just as a reminder, at the beginning of the biennium, the state reevaluates the composite index formula and outlines the ability of each locality's ability to pay for public education. A change in the LCI adjusts funding received from the state. So as the LCI increases, state funding goes down with the expectation that the locality would pick that up based on the deemed um, wealth of a county or a city. Um, when we began this biennium in 2017, it started in July, for the first time in many, many years, Williamsburg's composite index decreased from 0 0.80 to 0 0.7747. Uh, 0 0.80 is the maximum allowable composite index, so the, the formula um, stated that Williamsburg's wealth actually declined. So uh, we received a little bit of extra state money to offset that, um, however, Williamsburg only makes up about 10% of our budget. Looking at the James City County Composite Index, the Composite Index went up slightly from 0.5632 to 0.5641. Then a historical perspective from 2001 to the present, you can see uh, Williamsburg was consistently at 0.80 and that slight decline. James City County has been on a little bit of a roller coaster, so it was a little bit higher back in 2001, declined significantly in the recession and then is slowly making a tick back upwards. Ms. Berta, can you just remind us, what, not, you know, if there's like the formula, but just what elements uh, go into the formula? Okay. It's a huge formula. Yeah. Um, it's real estate tax um, rates, um, personal property tax, sales tax within the community. It's quite a, a large formula they go through and review every year. Um, this, this formula hasn't changed since the 80s, so it's quite antiquated. Um, so we'll see what the legislators do, if anything, with changing how they form 
uh, formulas or don't do. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, as we begin to look at our budget, of, of course, the enrollment is the driver. Um, we anticipate estimated revenues and staffing allocations based on that projected enrollment. We always look at three options. The first option being the governor's proposed budget. They do have an ADM that they recommend uh, that always is quite a bit higher than wherever we reality hits. Um, we use Future Think to a third party evaluation to look at enrollment and look at growth and birth rates and expected subdivision increases. Um, and we utilize uh, two enrollment projections from that being the low and the most likely. Over the last five years, we have come within 1% of our low enrollment projection. I will tell you an evaluation of the difference between low and most likely, it is only a swing of about 1% in enrollment, so it's not huge, it's not drastically different. Uh, then we look at our core content staffing allocations that have been adopted by the division. At the elementary K through two, we allocate 20 to one with a maximum cap on a class being 23. At third grade, that allocation is 22 students to one teacher with a cap of 25. At fourth and fifth grade, it is 25 to one with a cap of 28. At middle school, it is 18 and a half to one and high school is 20 to one. Can, can, at some point, not today, but can you remind us what SOQ is so we can just compare Absolutely. ourselves to SOQ? Yep. It's in your budget book too, so I'll send you the oh. pages from the budget book because okay, it shows um, our allocation and SOQ required allocation side by side. And nobody in the, in the Commonwealth runs this SOQ school system. No, it is important to remember that SOQ is minimal required funding. Um, there are no school divisions that I'm aware of that provide at SOQ. There are several that are very close, but they are very small school divisions. Very small, um, very rural, very poor. Yes, cool. yes. And um, the SOQ is what the General Assembly thinks you need, yeah. you need to have a, so. And that's what they provide us funding off of as the SOQ model. Right contributing to the lack of funding. So as we begin to look at the three options that I just went over, and as I stated, the governor's projected ADM and enrollment is always pretty significantly higher than what our reality is. The governor's proposed budget does have an ADM estimated at 11,577, which would create a growth of 146 students or 1.3% more. Uh, based on our staffing model, that would call for six additional teachers at a cost of 450,000. Looking at our future think low enrollment, and as I stated earlier, we are projecting an increase of 28 students, which is a 0.2% increase. Based on the current staffing model, that would not call for any additional teaching staff based on enrollment. Looking at the most likely projection, it is calling for an addition of 11,000, or uh, enrollment of 11,569, an addition of 138 students, or 1.2%, and the allocation based on the current staffing model would call for five additional teachers, or 375,000. So the fun part, moving forward, looking at the governor's budget. Um, this is our first look at this, and the General Assembly is in session right now, um, talking about how they are going to support, not support, modify, change, keep any of this information. So as we look at sales tax, and it is important to note in Williamsburg, James City County, it is a bit unique. Um, every other school division that I've had the luck to work for counts sales tax as state money. In this division, sales tax is considered local money. So we do not count that in our state. We look at it, but we don't count it in our money from the state. It is considered as part of the locality's allocation to us. As we look at sales tax, we are showing a slight decline in the estimated <coughs> sales tax to our localities of $27,064, or an adjustment of minus 0.2%. Uh, and before I get into talking about state revenues, do not be alarmed by the percentage change. Uh, annually, they seem to shift pots of how they allocate state monies to us. So from time to time, they'll shift lottery funds and SOQ funds back and forth. So while the percentages look out of whack, that is normal for this. Um, so when we looked at the standard of quality SOQ funding, there is a slight increase to $406,221, or a 1.4% increase. The categorical and incentive funding is showing a projected increase of $863,194, or a 45.1% increase. 
with the overall state increase on those two categories being 1269415 or 4%. I would like to tell you that I have included the bonus money in this calculation. So should that go away, this number will be reduced by 368000 Combining sales tax and state monies gives us $1,242,351 extra um, in our budget for next year projected for 2.8% increase. So what would the increase be if you took out the, the $360,000? Because it looked like the will of the board was not to. Yeah. yeah. A little under 900000 mm -hmm. Nine oh one four fifteen. My hope is with that that the General Assembly will say that if you give a step increase or a salary increase equivalent to one and a half percent that you can utilize those funds. It doesn't have to be specifically used for a bonus, which is why I've included it at okay. this point in time. Um, but I don't have a sense of that yet from the General Assembly because they just started this week. But but our division wouldn't be the only one hoping that that would be Correct. Nice. I've had some discussion with colleagues that were, were lobbying hard with legislators to try to get them to understand that if we're going to move forward in our salary scales, that's just as much incentive for state funding to be supportive of that. And it's revenue neutral or whatever to them. Yeah, right. right. And frankly, all these numbers are in flux because mm -hmm. they just went to work this week. They did. Um, so moving forward, we always have non-negotiable increases. I, I do separate out health insurance uh, from the non-negotiable category, even though it's on the slide, because we do have the option, should we experience an increase in health insurance, to pass that all on to an employee. This is assuming an estimated increase in our health insurance of 5%, and that monetary impact of 795000 is strictly looking at the cost escalation for the employer side of the house. So an employee, should this come to fruition, would also experience an increase to their rate by 5%. So I think it's important to delineate do we, that. Do we have a feel of how that much that number is actually going to be? Because sometimes it's been zero and sometimes it's been a lot less than it 5%. Is, it is very early for us to know um, numbers, but looking at trends with our HR department, we are showing a less increase than this amount. Um, but when we build this budget, remember whatever we present as the superintendent's proposed budget, once that number is released in a request, we cannot go up, we can only go down. So we would rather be conservative and have, in case we have a bad experience over the course of the next six months, have something built in um, should our utilization of the health insurance plan go up from what we we're seeing. feel like we'll get a better... Typically, we get that number in late February or early March. Uh, we are pressing our local choice providers to try to give that to us sooner. So it's, so it's before we submit our budget to the supervisors? It is. Absolutely. Yes, we will have it well in advance of April 1st. This is the one area where I wanted to get a sense from the board. We have already talked with staff about providing uh, me some options to look at in terms of making minor adjustments to the health insurance. If we provide uh, a one percent raise, obviously we don't want to give one on one hand and take away on the other. But if we in increase <laughs> salaries and retirement, and we do end up making an adjustment in the the cost uh, for employee employer in the health insurance, uh, and it, and we do take some back, then at least the money's in retirement as well as a as, as a salary raise. So I've asked them to look at the sharing percentage and give some options so that I can present them to the board. And I've also asked staff to relook again at um, spouses and what we charge and the a potential uh, extra payment for spouses who have insurance of their own. This is one of the few areas where we can perhaps bring some revenue and put it towards other things. It's a, it's a difficult decision, but I did want to bring some possibilities if you're interested in seeing those. Just to share some anecdotal information, so I work for a local small company um, and manage our health insurance, and so ours is going up 7%, but one of the things that we've been able to do is offer base coverage to all employees that we actually do cover at 100%, and then if they want a more expensive plan, the buy-up plan, um, they, they pay the difference. 
So it's given our, our employees options and it's and it's kept our insurance costs down. We do the same thing here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've three different options. We introduced a new option last year, had a health insurance task force, looked at a lot of variables and brought a well, Mr. Baker can probably provide better information than I can, but we introduced, uh, we, we changed our plans and introduced a, a high deductible plan, basically. Yeah, and, it, and we have to look at, by creating that stir, how much are we really benefiting all the different employees that are involved in it? And, and so, so creating that stir and getting 75,000 at the end of it, is it really worth creating that stir about? So, I mean, it's, it's there's, you know, it's, and the employees look at it. Look at it, you know. The, they don't. They don't look at the salary line. They look at the take-home line and, and all the items that go into that. Their VRS contributions, the health insurance, and so when you when you throw confetti at yourself for giving them a one percent raise, but their number at the, at the bottom goes down, um, that is not engaging our employees. And so, it, and so if you, so if you, if part of that you you charge a few a little less money but charge some a lot more money that's does that really help so there's a lot of variables in that absolutely to discuss there um <coughs> i would i'm curious about the, the new option you uh, mentioned the hsa and what the take-up rate was on that and if, if uh, not now but just in the future extremely Tim small has it. yeah and it's if we if there's a way to incent that um as a way to uh, generate cost savings, not only in, in the next budget, but more importantly, long term. Um, that's I think Mr. Baker actually has that number for you, uh, because we're, we were monitoring it quite closely to see how many would move to that plan. It's, it's been a, uh, we do incentivize it now, but we've only had about a half a dozen folks even participate uh, in the high deductible plan. And this is the first year that people start learning about Controlling their own uh, health care cost. And, and when you put those dramatic changes out there, some people aren't going to do it because they don't know what that really means to them. Mm -hmm. And so you have a couple of early adopters who are willing to take that risk and, and they figure out they got burned or if they didn't, and then those stories get out and people start changing. So not, there may be a natural migration this year that may help us, but we don't know. I'd like to, at a future conversation, better understand those incentives for that related to the HSA. And then, who knows what happens in Washington, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So then we begin to look at non-negotiable increases, things that we have absolutely no control over unless things change from the General Assembly. Uh, the big ticket item this year is the increase for the VRS employer rate. I'd like to say employer. It's not going to impact an employee. It's going to impact our budget as an employer. Um, they have accelerated the increase um, to get 100% funded at the state level for VRS. The impact of that is changing the VRS rate from 14.66% to 16.32%. Additionally, a component of VRS is the retiree health insurance credit, which is changing from 1.11 to 1.23. So the total VRS percentage increase expected is 1.78%. The impact of that for WJCC is an increase to our budget of 1.4 million. Um, I don't know that there's much traction at the General Assembly level to delay that a year. Um, we've been trying for the groups that I've been part of, and I know the Association of Superintendents has as well. Um, but I don't know that we have much traction to change that. So that is one of those variables that are pro is probably going to come to light and we're going to have to deal with and um, fit into our budget. Is this just for this year and, and the expectation is that this is a big hit this year, but yes. not next year? I mean, it, it's, it, it it's would have to be sustained. Yes. Um, so once that 1.4 million is added, it would be sustained right. from now until whenever the rates adjusted up or down. Yeah, you'll be at 1.23 percent and 16.32 percent yep. going forward. Has that, to be sustained. That hit in our budget is this, this year. This year, shock. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, but it but that's there. that stays there. It's not like it's not like it, you go back up 1.4 the next year. Okay. It's, it's, and, it's, it's a, and then every decision it's, it's going new, forward. New way of life. Norm. Yeah. Okay. And then every decision going forward to increase salaries would be impacted by that new rate as well. So it's just a compounding. And every time we increase FTEs, like for yeah. example, pathways, we're yes. just adding Correct. to. Correct. 
So then every year we look at um, other areas that we don't have any control over with contractual um, obligations, meaning the New Horizons Center or New Horizons um, Agreement, general insurance. Uh, we know this year we are going to have to hire the principal for James Blair Middle School since that comes online in the school year 19. And we need an additional ESL teacher to address that growing population that I shared earlier. Additionally, because of special education and the requirements that we are required to um, support those students, we are in need of four additional special ed teachers and three special ed teacher assistants. We do have some shifts as we evaluate our grant funding that we need to shift funding from grants to local to support and make sure that we don't exceed our grant allocation. And then just general contractual obligations based on the consumer price index increasing. All of those combined total about a million dollars. So when we look at the impact of health insurance, the VRS adjustment, and all of those other um, non-negotiable increases, we subtotaled $3.2 million of an increase. Net that against the governor's budget, inclusive of the bonus money, and we are looking at before we even start with any of our priorities at a deficit of $1,957,649. So why didn't we do this first? And then <laughs> because that would have changed your mind on that. <laughs> so just to be clear, we're $2 million in the hole, not including... Correct. Any anything. adjustments from where we are today. And the stopping in this piece, we don't have a choice. Uh, because the, Mr. Joel will explain to those who are not aware of it that there's a point system that drives the need for special education teachers. You want to give us a quick, just a quick sense of what that looks like? That there's really, it's, it's driven by things beyond us with no control over. Good morning, everyone. Um, the state guides the requirements as far as the caseloads that our special education teachers can um, carry, and that can look anywhere from um, it's a point system. And so you saw we have 1,715 students based on our December 1 count. Those students can count anywhere from what we call one point to two and a half points, depending on the level of need the students need. So if you have a student that is primary, primarily in general education classes, getting some direct services in those classes, and it's less than 50% of the day, they, they're counting as one point. A student that gets services more than 50% of the day counts as two points. And our students that have multiple needs, for instance, some of our um, autism students, some of our multiply disabled students count as two and a half points. Teachers' caseloads can range anywhere from 16 to 24 points. Most teachers' um, caseloads cap at 20. Again, it depends on which population they're serving. Um, so you could have nine students and a teacher could be at their caseload max. And so it's, we have to look at the total number of students, but we also have to look at the services that we're delivering. And that really um, stipulates the number of teachers. So while you see that we've had an increase in students, um, as, as Ms. Berta said earlier, we also are having more and more students that have um, higher levels of needs. We have a, a number of medically fragile children that are receiving services in our schools on a daily basis. Do you have an idea of what percentage um, of the cost of educating based on the requirements is provided by the federal or state government? Uh, in I other words... I can get that to you. We had yeah. just looked at that, and I don't want to speak from memory. Um, just would like to know how much of that we have to generate locally. A great deal of it. And compared to our sister systems close by, uh, is this kind of similar, or I guess what I'm wondering is, it have, are we doing such a great job in our training and in our handling of special ed that we are um, a magnet for, for families that come into the Tidewater area and compare services and then go, whoa, we gotta, we've got to move to WJCC? We do have parents that move here specifically for that reason. We also have a huge military population, and within within the military program, their advocates will will tell military families where to move specifically if they have children with special needs. And our percentage 
of students with special needs right now is about 11. It's about 13. 13. 13. Okay. 13. Okay. Versus Fort County. Typically, for most divisions, it ranges from about 10 to 12 percent. Typically, we're probably slightly above the average. The, the benchmarking mm -hmm. is yes. within. Thank you. So as we continue to go forward and looking at the revenue impact, um, starting with a negative 1.9 million, um, and looking at low enrollment, and, and as I stated just a few minutes ago, that does not call for any additional teachers based on the staffing model that's currently in place. However, um, with the continued growth in the, our ELL and special ed population that we don't always have the ability to forecast and anticipate, um, as well as a responsible budgeting process. And prior to my arrival um, two years ago, there actually was reserve positions that were built into the budget because you did have those unknowns. And uh, as much as we have reduced and created efficiencies within our budget, we just don't have the resources to go to should we have an event like that happen and an unforeseen bubble pop up where we need to hire an additional teaching staff. So. We currently have um, recommended, and it may or may not make it to the superintendent's proposed budget, but at this time we are thinking that mm -hmm. we need to add reserve positions back. And currently I have five listed um, with a cost of 375000 So that would add to our revenue impact and increase that to a negative $2.3 million um, before we begin the budget process. That does conclude our prepared presentation for today's retreat. We will continue to monitor the progress and information as the General Assembly progresses through the month of February. And we look forward to continued discussion for the fiscal year 18 budget development process. I appreciate your attention and participation today. You're not gonna have, you don't have a good news slide that you're in I wish I did. Um, as far as, as far as, you know, I, I, this really points out for me, uh, reiterates the fact that the problem with, with the public education is in, is in Richmond, not in Mounts Bay, um, or, or with the city. I mean, if you look at the first slide there, we, where you see the, where you see the funding that has gone down, the, the, for the historical state funding from 32 million in 2009 to 31 million now, 31.7 million now. That the state is the state is not meeting their commitment to public education in the Commonwealth. Uh, Mounts Mounts Bay has done a lot. James City County, Williamsburg have done a lot to to bridge that gap, and they have made a lot of sacrifices for it. And they have they have helped us. Um, you know, going going and going and yelling at the supervisors to provide more money is not really where the answer is. It's got it's got to come from Richmond. It's got to come from the legislature. Um, and I I do appreciate all the work that the that the that the county and the city has done through this through this issue to augment and, and to and to help help support public education in Williamsburg James City County and so it's uh, it's uh, frustrating uh, you know we have all these good things that we want to do and we're we're down two and a half million start and so it's it's a very so if you want to add stuff you have to take stuff away if you want to if you want to have a pathways program at all three high schools you've got to take stuff away I mean, it's just you can't nothing there's no free lunch we can't we can't like the federal government you know budget ourselves to be negative right so um, it's just frustrating so anyway so can you so with a 2.3 million dollar deficit without any priorities added on can you talk to us a little bit about uh, anticipated sources of other revenue this focuses on the state but we've got local funders can you can you um, it is very early in our budget process, and I do not believe that our funding partners have begun their process. I think they're beginning that this week. Um, I don't have any anticipated increase. I don't know if Dr. Heron has any information, but I have not heard from my colleagues um, as to what they think their ability to help assist us and increase any budgets would be. But, but they, but, but James City County at least uh, has something on paper, right? Um, 
They do have a biennial budget and I believe it's about 1.7% in the budget that was created for two years from the county. And so what would that number be? What would that figure be? 1.6 million. So we take the 1.6 million, add that to our bottom line of negative 2 point whatever million Three. we've Got and then. You only gotta take eight hundred thousand dollars out of your budget. But that's—I mean—that's what we're looking at, mm -hmm. sort of. Okay, that would be kind of clear. It's nice to have that kind of clear for everyone to see. That certainly will be presented in the superintendent's proposed budget once we have opportunity to speak mm -hmm. to our colleagues on the funding partner sides. Yes, I don't want to publish a number out no. there until we know. Yeah, who, I know. We've I had know. those conversations. I understand that. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, so before we adjourn, I'd like to draw everybody's attention to some of the documents that were left at your seats, the um, approved budget calendar and the draft revised budget calendar. Um, and um, because of the dynamic situation in Richmond, the uh, uh, Dr. Heron and Ms. Berta have uh, talked to, uh, would like to talk to us about perhaps shifting um, and revising the budget calendar, uh, which would, uh, if this board would like to do that, uh, would be action that we would take at Tuesday's meeting. Um, essentially, the way this works is we hear, we take in information um, today we take in information again when the superintendent uh, proposes the budget. And then uh, last year, we had two opportunities for discussion before adoption. Uh, historically, that um, there have been times where there's been one opportunity for discussion. So um, if, we, if this board is interested in approving uh, the, the change, uh, the idea would be to hear the, the superintendent's proposed budget on February 21st instead of February 7th and then discuss on March 7th and then discuss on March 21st with an option to adopt if the March 7th meeting indicates that that's a possibility but then having a um, tentative meeting scheduled on the 28th of March to adopt if the 21st results and changes that then would need to be reviewed again, if that makes any sense. So, um, Dr. Heron. What well, that allows us is just a little bit more time to attempt to get a real percentage on health insurance in particular. And it's a short session of the General Assembly and it allows us to, it, it closes a week after the 21st. It, it, we may have a more realistic figure of state funding, and we may even know about their proposed bonus, whether that stays a bonus or turns to something else. So it means we're not presenting something and then having to consider major, major changes. Not saying we'll have everything we need by then, but we would be much closer than two weeks earlier. So um, critical dates, we have to give it to the supervisors by the 1st of April. That's right. On or before April 1st. It has to come back from them <coughs> by? May 15th. And then we have to issue contracts to teachers sometime after May 15th or after the implications of what May 15th means to us. We are slated to adopt your final budget on May 16th, but that certainly could change based on what we do and when we receive back our funding partners' budgets. Right, so, we'll, so if it comes back from, from them on May 15th with either positives or negatives, we'll, go, we'll keep a good attitude. Um, and then we have to figure out how that how that affects our budget, and then we have to and and issuing contracts on the first of June is a very complicated thing that Mr. Baker, I'm sure, really enjoys. <laughs> yeah. so, okay. so we're looking at the joint meeting and the budget discussion approval having to occur prior. It, it, you have March down here to be determined, but it really has to occur before March seventh. Is Your budget correct? discussion and approval option in March, I added at Ms. Cook's um, request. And I think the thought process was that possibly if you needed an additional date after March 21st, uh, you didn't feel comfortable enough to adopt your budget, 
on March 21st that you would add a date after that date but prior to April 1st so that we would be able to make any adjustments and get that finalized document special, to our funding partners. A special meeting. A special meeting. Yeah. Special after meeting. March 21st potentially. Yeah. Okay, so it, so it would be nice for me to have the April 1st some slot on here for April 1st. Like that is some kind of a... It's on the last page. Yeah. 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 The third page is the yeah. critical yeah. dates of April 1st. But you've got May before April well, this no. This is a separate. This separate. Is a, this is a separate. This is the critical dates page. Uh, yeah, and and April first doesn't require any action on our part. Okay. Got it. Okay. So yeah. the, there's no way to put these critical ones on the big. We have not draft. typically incorporated them into our draft. Trying to keep our calendar to one page. That's why I created that separate it critical date it calendar. Like eight font. <laughs> <laughs> you can't um, read. They just have to be done by the first of April. Right. And so we adopt on the 21st of March or the 28th of March. That uh, gives Ms. Berta time to deliver the budget by April 1st to the localities. So is that something that... Yeah. And if the board's comfortable with that, we would, is that an action item just on Tuesday to adjust the budget calendar, we need to add it to the agenda. Yeah, we would amend the agenda because the agenda is already published, so we would just amend the agenda to include that action item. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Um, and do we have, have work sessions been scheduled with the localities for, can you keep us abreast of that if we're, mm -hmm. um, Any other comments or questions? Okay. With that, we are adjourned.